Okay, folks. Mayor, sir. Thank you, uh, Boyd. Uh, folks, before we do our moment of silence uh, today, I just want to acknowledge what happened in our community yesterday and then ask Councillor Outfit if he has anything he wishes <clears throat> to say. We had an uh, incident at uh, C.P. Allen School yesterday that I think shocked us all and is very concerning. And I um, want to share with the students, the staff, the broader school community, um, you know, our thoughts are with them understand the concerns that everybody has when something like this happens in their school um, and and the uh, and the school board of this uh, HRCE Halifax Regional Center of Education um, <clears throat> and uh, I noticed that took place at Charles P Allen High School in Bedford I won't speculate on the causes or on the next steps at this early stage However, I do feel it appropriate to let staff, students, parents impacted by yesterday's incident know that we are thinking about them at this time. I also want to thank the first responders who were involved with this incident. I've already spoken with a couple of them to express our appreciation and our support. The incident could have been much worse. This is a wonderful facility with tremendous staff, wonderful school spirit, strong teams, and high academic standards. Both of our daughters attended CPA and I believe they are better off because of it. But as we sadly learned over the last several years, our city, province, and our country are not immune to incidents that once we thought could only happen elsewhere. However, we have also proven that we are strong and resilient. Yesterday also gave, provided further evidence that we must continue to support and innovate on how we address public safety, wellness, and policing issues in our community. We need to work with partners such as, as police, public safety, the provincial government, the HRCE, community groups, etc., to foster safety and wellness in our community. It's a challenge, but our municipality is worth it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. We'll take a moment of silence now to think about that and prepare for our meeting. Thank you. Okay. I want to begin our meeting acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq, the traditional unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We honor the peace and friendship uh, treaties. We consider ourselves to all be treaty people. And also want to acknowledge the over four centuries of the African Nova Scotian population here in um, our community and our important relationship we have with that community, um, especially as we go forward and provide more opportunities for communities that have had less in the past. I want to also just say that today is World Down Syndrome Day, and uh, as the only city I know of in the world that has a town crier with um, Down Syndrome, he's not the town crier because he has Down Syndrome, but he is a town crier who has Down Syndrome, and he raised the flag with a number of his friends and members of the community today, and um, we're very proud of him and uh, pleased to acknowledge the important uh, contributions of people with Down Syndrome in our community. Okay, I will go to announcements and acknowledgements if there are any. Councillor Cuttle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have two important community announcements today. Um, the first is to let people know that on April 1st, um, we'll be marking the 150th anniversary of the wreck of the SS Atlantic, um, which happened en route to Halifax when it hit rocks off Lower Prospect 
in the prospect communities. Um, of the four, of the 975 on board, some 550 perished in the worst single vessel marine disaster to occur off the Canadian coast prior to the sinking of the Titanic. And thanks to the efforts of fishermen from Lower Prospect, Upper Prospect, and Terence Bay, more than 400 were saved. Um, on March 31st, the SS Atlantic Heritage Park Society will be co-hosting a service. And on April 1st, from 2 to 6, community members and descendants of the rescuers will come together at the Whites Lake Legion to remember those who died in the wreck and honor the courage of the rescuers and local families who opened their homes to the victims. As well, I would also like to note that um, Purple Day is coming up. I've got my, my, my Purple Day t-shirt on, um, which is in support of, uh, of epilepsy and raising awareness around epilepsy. On March 26th annually, people in countries around the world are invited to wear purple and host events in support of epilepsy awareness. This, uh, this day was started by a local resident in the Prospect communities, Megan Cassidy from Shad Bay, um, who, created, who came up with this idea in 2008, motivated by her own struggles with epilepsy. And Cassidy's goal is to get people talking about epilepsy in an effort to dispel myths and inform those with seizures that they are not alone. So I'd like to invite everybody on March 26th to wear purple, and there will be a flag raising and grand parade on Thursday to mark that event as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm wearing purple for that too. And I'll wear it again. <clears throat> there was a uh, gala. Councillor Mancini would have been at the gala. I don't know if anybody else was at that on Saturday while I was away at the uh, Junos. But she is uh, one remarkable uh, individual cast. Thank you for that. Councillor Kent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to just take this opportunity to acknowledge and send condolences to the folks out in Edmonton, their Edmonton police services, where they had lost two young constables in uh, the service of their duties as police officers, Constable Be Brett Ryan and Constable Travis Jordan. Um, for those of you who may not be aware, Travis was in fact, uh, is in fact a Nova Scotian and was trained here with uh, many members of our Halifax Regional Police Services. So uh, I think it's important that we acknowledge the work that is being done across our nation in policing services. Uh, as the Board of Police Chair, I, I, you know, work, we work as commissions to, commissioners to um, support and protect and uh, care for the members that are putting their lives on the line each day for us. Um, uh, so I would uh, ask that we, you know, publicly send our condolences to the families, uh, the members of the Edmonton Police Services, and to our own here at Halifax Regional Police, because when officers are lost, they're lost and felt by everyone. So just thought that we should uh, acknowledge that. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. I have spoken with the Mayor of Edmonton. I know that Chief Kinsella has spoken with Chief McPhee in Edmonton, and I think we will have a representation of officers at the funeral, which I believe is on uh, Monday. That's um, it's just a call that nobody wants to get. Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mayor. I would like to uh, let everybody know that St. John's United Church is having a ham supper on the Fall River Road on March 25th. Uh, ham supper is great. The desserts are even better. Um, and then there's an Easter egg hunt on April 1st at 10 o'clock at the Upper Muscadaba Wooden Playground. And so if you've not made it up to the Wooden Playground, it's an awesome spot. You should check it out. And just to my colleagues, for uh, anyone who's got nonprofits in their uh, districts, the Community Grants Program closes. The last day for applications is March 31st. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Mayor. Also today, March 21st, is also the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and should be recognized uh, internationally for the uh, purpose of, that, of uh, having equality for all, for all races. Also tonight, uh, 7 o'clock, the Mineville Community Association will be having its annual general meeting at the uh, Lake Echo Fellowship Baptist Church. 
at 7 p.m. tonight. Tomorrow night, Wednesday the 22nd, 6.30, the RCMP are having an open uh, house town hall meeting at the North Preston Community Centre. On Thursday, March 23rd at 6.30 at night, uh, the East Preston Greenway Active Transportation Public Meeting update will be occurring. Uh, Thursday the 23rd at 6.30 and also again on Monday the 27th at 1 o'clock, both at the East Preston Rec Centre. And on Saturday, March 25th, the Port Lake Community Service Association will be having a spaghetti supper. There are two sittings, 5 o'clock and 6 o'clock at the Port Lake Community Hall. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to uh, acknowledge yesterday, which was International Francophonie Day here in, uh, in Nova Scotia, uh, but more importantly here in HRM, uh, where we have the largest Francophone and bilingual population in the province. Uh, very proud to uh, celebrate uh, the Acadian and Francophone communities in HRM. Uh, obviously, we have uh, just completed uh, the project to put bilingual uh, stop signs at our CSAP uh, school districts which uh, we're proud to uh, partner uh, with the province of Nova Scotia who started that uh, program back in 2021 and um, you know just also wanted to give a shout out to our French services strategy and all of our call agents as well as at 321 and staff members who support the French language and services offered in French. Merci beaucoup. Thank you Councillor. Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. Uh, just building on what uh, Councillor Lovely said uh, Councillor Hensby and I were on the radio a little while ago and uh, one of the callers had mentioned that it was $400 per stop sign. Uh, that number has since been corrected. It is somewhere around $46 per stop sign. So it is it is uh, far less of a magnitude than, than people had expected. Um, what I would like to mention is that there is a conversation on housing and homelessness happening uh, in the Coppicwood region. And this is coming up on April 3rd um, from 10 a.m. until 2 p.m and it's being held at the Bedford United Church, uh, 1200 Bedford Highway. So this is just to see um, what the different service providers, what those who are interested in helping out uh, with this challenge of, of housing and homelessness uh, are able to accomplish. There is a lot of good work going on, especially in Sackville and nearby areas. Um, and so this is just a, just a continuation of that. Uh, and so everybody is invited again uh, April 3rd from 10 a.m. until 2 p.m. Bedford United Church, 1200 Bedford Highway. Thank you. Thank you. I heard those signs were a million dollars each, so I'm glad that it's not quite that much. Um, anything else, uh, uh, colleagues? <clears throat> if not, uh, we'll look to the approval of the minutes of March the 7th as circulated. Moved by Councillor Kent, seconded by Councillor Mason. All in favour? I, uh, on the approval of the order of business, uh, first of all, just to let people know, we have a committee of the whole that was uh, scheduled uh, for today, which we're moving, we decided yesterday to move. We originally set this council at one o'clock. It looked like a relatively light agenda, but things have been added to it. So we <clears throat> decided to give full attention yesterday and the fact of the public hearing that we will begin our next meeting with the committee of the whole um, on the, what is the playing field strategy. Mr. Clerk, anything from you? There is one added item from um, item 18.1 for the agenda today. Thank you. Has everybody got 18.1? That's Councillor Morse. Is that the, yep, yeah, that's been circulated and that's, a, that's on the agenda. Councillor Outhit. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, I circulated a, a memo the other day to the clerk, to you, and to uh, colleagues asking that information item six be brought forward today. And that was uh, unanimously agreed to. So, wherever you and the clerk would like to put this in the agenda, I would appreciate it. So, everybody's approved that. So, that will go on the agenda. We'll make that 18.2 added items. There's one thing I wonder if we might entertain. We, we have a couple of items that involve external stakeholders. Um, that is item 1515, the Halifax International Airport Authority. I see we have the, some people from the airport here, including the CAO and uh, others. Um, it has been our practice, if we could, to uh, allow guests to get in and out of council. Not that they don't enjoy it, because I know they do. Uh, but I'm wondering if that one, and also the 15.1.4, um, skilled talent recruitment and retention strategy. I see, Wendy, you're here to speak to that. 
Would council entertain us moving those two items up in the agenda? Moved by Councillor Lovelace, seconded by Councillor Blackburn. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So we'll move those up to uh, uh, just before CAO reports, if that's okay with everybody. Anybody else on the agenda? John? Yeah, we, do, we have some uh, in-camera items which uh, involve staff too, uh, which we at one point had wondered whether we'd move up, but we decided we'd start the meeting in public. We'll have a look at where we are just before the three o'clock break and then may come back to you with an adjustment in the schedule uh, on that. For now, we'll leave that as it is. Thank you, John. <clears throat> okay, so the order of business as amended. Councillor Daigle Gammon, seconded by Councillor Purdy. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? We have that, uh, those changes made, Ian. You got everything you need. Um, consent agenda. There is uh, three items on the consent agenda. Councillor Mason. I'll move the agenda that Halifax Regional Council approve recommendations on the following items, 15.11, 15.12, and 15.21. Just a question. Did we not discuss yesterday at agenda review one of those couldn't be on consent? That issue has been rectified. We're okay with this. Okay. So those three items are being proposed on the consent agenda, moved by Councillor Mason, seconded by Councillor Cleary. Question? Um, okay, we're good. Let's go to the, go to the machines on that. That's passed, so that means that we have passed 1511, which is appointment of development officers, 15 one two, which is the declaration of surplus property on uh, Lister Drive in Bedford, and fifteen two one out of audit and finance funding request for Banook Canoe Club. Those three things are deemed to have passed on consent. Business arising calls for declaration of interest and motions of reconsideration none. Motions of rescission, none. Deferred business, none. Tabled matters, none. We do have a public hearing tonight at six o'clock. Interim incentive, that's bonus zoning outside the regional center. Correspondence, Mr. Clerk. Correspondence has been received for item 12.1 and item 15.15. All correspondence has been circulated to all members of regional council. Thank you. Petitions, colleagues? No petitions, there's no information items brought forward. We'll move to the items that we've moved up beginning with 1514. This is the skilled talent recruitment and retention strategy. Now, is there a presentation on that? Or no presentation, just ready to go. So this, uh, what council, what is your wish? Councillor Mason. 1513. 15.14. Happy to move it. Uh, Halifax Regional Council uh, 1 disperse $208,572 net HST included to the Halifax Partnership in 2022 23 for the funding for fiscal services to undertake enhanced and targeted international recruitment for skilled tradespeople and laborers needed by the construction industry to build housing and to identify how local employers can help address the housing needs of its employees and to report back to council in 2023-24. I so move. Councillor Mason. So I'm actually excited to put this on the floor as a member of the board of Halifax Partnership and, and Wendy Luther and is here to answer any questions council may have, but uh, this is a departure for Halifax Partnership. They don't do labor uh, in the past. They haven't done uh, this kind of uh, skilled talent recruitment, uh, but the need is great. The need is extremely high in Halifax. We know that the real, the missing uh, leg of the stool right now in terms of building housing and building construction uh, of all kinds is uh, lack of labor. And so I, th I thank the mayor for bringing this forward and, and uh, uh, getting us on this path. And uh, this is kind of a down payment on a, what would be a pilot project. And unlike a lot of things we give Halifax Partnership money for, this one will have like actual clear, like, like mm -hmm. metrics, right? You know, we're going to go recruit people. How many people did we recruit? So council will be able to monitor that as things go forward based on the Halifax Partnership's uh, 
outstanding track record with everything else that we uh, asked them to do, I'm quite confident that it'll turn out quite well. So uh, my main question was, was $208,000 enough, but I'm assured that for the first uh, to pilot this and to get it started, that this is the, uh, the appropriate amount. So I'd ask Council to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm very happy to uh, to support this initiative. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think we may have forgotten is that we're entering the 10th year of um, One Nova Scotia report. That Ivany report, um, you know, I'm not sure if it's going to be updated anytime soon, but boy, a lot has changed in the last decade. Uh, so it's a completely different world here in HRM economically, uh, you know, and, and socially as well. And so, you know, when I think about, uh, you know, looking at the metrics as far as, uh, and I'm wondering if Wendy Luther can speak to this, about how do we support local employers? Uh, you know, we're, we're struggling with housing needs in particular in rural communities that that benefits so much from tourism and yet at the same time we can't keep those people uh, you know because uh, and we can't recruit those people because there's nowhere for those folks to live so I'm just wondering Wendy if you can speak a little bit to uh, kind of the expectations of how we go about um, helping uh, employers uh, support their employees um, to to have adequate housing in order to actually have these burgeoning uh, businesses in these rural communities thank you uh, Wendy Luther, just before I go to you, uh, just a spoiler alert, if you want an update on the uh, Ivany report, come to the Mayor's State of the Municipality address on oh, April the 5th, there go. <laughs> where I know for a fact that it will feature very prominently. Uh, Wendy? Thank you. <laughs> Worship to Councillor Lovelace. Thank you for the question. And yes, indeed, what a different reality we have here. Um, I spent the morning uh, at a ministerial roundtable with Minister Jill Balser, our provincial uh, Minister of Immigration. Uh, and um, what was so notable is the intersectionality now that we would have never seen before between bringing people here, being able to house them, and transport them to their area of employment and recreation so when we're, when we're looking at these issues we have to look at them holistically now more than ever before also to your point and question around employers because labor and access to talent and I'm joined here today by my colleague Robin Webb who le leads our labor team to also help answer any questions you might have um, Talent is cited as the number one barrier to business growth today yeah. here. And this is a global phenomenon, not just experienced here in HRM. So employers are opening their minds and their creativity and their problem solving skills to how can they play a bigger role. So you might have seen an uh, announcement by the province last week as it pertains to funding for modular housing. Now they listed a number of different counties within Nova Scotia, not including yeah. HRM. And that as an example is employers stepping up, um, exploring how they can put money and effort behind creating housing for their workforce, even if it's on a temporary basis. So as an example, uh, a local IT employer, they're having a hard time recruiting and getting their staff here on a timely basis because their staff can't find housing, so they can't move. And some are moving, but they're living in Airbnbs. And so that is just not sustainable. So everything from making connections between the builders and a shout out to the Shaw Group that you may know that is investigating innovative and inexpensive ways to bring modular housing online quicker. With our post-secondaries, some of whom have um, residential, their residences available in different times of year that can be a landing pad for workers in other industries. And that's what we will be exploring to undertake here. Also, Councillor Mason, uh, did comment that we are, we for all of our 26 and a half years have worked on labor side, connecting newcomers and recent grads to work opportunities, but it's only very recently that through our marketing reach as well as our team, Robin was recently traveling with our provincial colleagues in Paris and Rabat, Morocco to actively uh, recruit workers with, um, with job offers in hand. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> if we're uh, targeting areas, we might want to start in Alberta, uh, encouraging people to uh, 
to uh, ignore what they're hearing because the best is here and get others. Uh, uh, personal note, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Wendy and team, for, for being here. So, so excited about this. Um, one of the questions I have, well, two questions I have, uh, understanding that we need about 6,200 new laborers to uh, deal with the shortage of, of, of um, laborers needed to help in the construction industry. One of the concerns is, obviously, you mentioned it, it's part of it is to find them housing, but we also need these laborers to build the housing, to find them housing. So it's one of those weird things where I, I'm very curious to see how we're able to kind of, I don't want to say chicken before the egg cart and all that, I'm not going to use that, but you, you just said it and I said it, thanks, thanks, counselor. Uh, uh, for, Throwing off my train of thought. Uh, other, so I, I am, I am wondering on, on, on with this, just how you're going to kind of square that circle, understanding that we need them to build the housing, but we also need housing for them. The other piece I'm wondering, the industry, how will they be involved with, with this? And you already kind of mentioned a little bit, so just wonder if there's anything else you want to share. And the only other aspect I do worry about is if, you know, say this is very successful, we bring, you know, thousands of new folks here to help in our, in our, our industry. I do worry about, you know, where, where they get placed in communities because we already see what's happening with interna international folks who are coming into the communities and um, not being as welcome as they should. And, you know, for bringing folks in to, to come here particularly to do work, sometimes if, especially you could be in areas that are not used to seeing new international folks come in, just wondering what supports will possibly be in place or maybe organizations like ICANs we might, we might engage just to make sure that, that you know, they, are, they feel welcomed and are welcomed in uh, our communities. Thank you through the mayor to Councillor Smith and then my colleague Robin uh, will, will help address the settlement piece. So um, as you're, I'm sure you're all aware in, in speaking to your constituents and business owners, um, across all sectors, almost all sectors that you can think of right now, there's an acute need for labor. Right. We put this forward as starting with the housing industry because there's many others that need need labor for the exact reason, uh, Councillor, that you raised, is that as we bring people here, where are they gonna live? And how are we, it's, it's as much about retention, or it's more about retention than it is about recruitment. So how are we making sure that the people that we actively seek to come uh, truly belong and feel like they belong when they arrive? And a big part of that is having adequate housing. So, um, when I, in answering Councillor Lovelace's question about these creative solutions, so we're talking about this temporary modular housing outside of HRM, what does that kind of solution look for, look like here within our HRM boundaries? As we all know, HRM has the largest rural population of any county in Nova Scotia, and our rural constituents, I'm looking at Councillor Hensby and others, uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon, also have acute housing challenges to bring workers, so it is is a chicken and the egg issue, um, but through working with the private sector and many industry partners, how are we being creative? And, and today, I cannot tell you what the municipal barriers might be to, um, that need to be removed in order to make that happen, but I look forward to exploring those with you where, where there's a municipal levers or changes that need to be made to allow for some of these creative housing solutions uh, within HRM. On the settlement side, we're, we always work with many partners on our labor programs, and I'll, I'll pass the floor to my colleague Robin to, to share some of those. Wonderful, thank you, Wendy. Yeah, I mean, we've been working with our settlement partners like the ISANS and the Y for decades. Um, we've proven a very successful settlement um, uh, initiatives through the Atlantic Immigration Program that are, you know, that have helped increase our retention rates over the years um, like we've not seen before. So um, through the Atlantic Immigration Program, for example, and a lot of other Nova Scotia nominee programs that are employer focused, the employers must commit to cultural um, inclusion training. Um, and it's not just, it's one or two people in that organization, but they have to prove that they will, that will be from the top down, that they will have a welcoming, safe work space for newcomers when they, when they arrive on their works, uh, the workplace. 
So, you know, there's a lot of work to be done um, outside of, of the, the workplace as well with welcoming communities. So we're engaged in having conversations, more conversations about that um, with some of our partners. So this is a pilot, um, but we are not new to our partners that we've been working with for many years. It's a, you know, just recently doing a lot of international recruitment um, opportunities with Destination Canada, um, which really opened our eyes as to what, what the gap was, what we're missing. And this position that we would be hiring for would be a person that would have international recruitment um, certification. So this resource not only will help the you know, industries that are in demand right now, like the construction industry, but also some of our SMEs that you're working with that don't have a full-time HR person that can answer some questions about immigration, but they need to hire through immigration. So this will be even, you know, that this position will be focused though on supporting the industries like the construction industry, uh, first and foremost, in how we can be a partner to work that they've already started, plans that they've already got established, but need our help. Um, so. Uh, working with um, the province, the provincial and federal immigration programs to see what's best suitable for um, the industry. And it's a combination of many programs depending on the, the um, employer. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, yes, thank yeah. you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm always in favor of, of uh, you know, f attracting and, and creating opportunities for the workers that we need. Um, but what rings sort of uh, loudly in, m in my thoughts, and I think it has to be parallel to this um, kind of step, is that although there is a narrative out in the public that there are lots of jobs, there are still a lot of people who are not working. And there are a lot of people who may have never considered any kind of skilled uh, uh, career opportunity, and I I worry for them, particularly our younger um, generation, who are every day I hear of a parent who has just had a young adult move back in. I'm one the same, and and young people who are uh, struggling just to get a, a bare minimum wage job because so much is now done online, they're faceless, they're in a pool of thousands, um, and I just think, have we done enough to look at our population that is here now, living here now, uh, possibly not working or working a job that is barely paying their bills or is unsatisfying um, to give them opportunities to learn about what might be available in this, this era of construction, building, um, housing development, all of that. Because they're, they're, I feel, I worry a little that when we start looking out of province, we are missing an opportunity that we just shouldn't be missing. So if you could comment on that element, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, through the mayor to Councillor Kent. And that was a wonderful question to help me highlight some of our existing programs okay. and to talk about People, Planet, Prosperity, Halifax's inclusive economic strategy. And a big part of that inclusion is acknowledging that we need all HRM residents to benefit from and contribute to our growing economic prosperity. So some of the ways that we hit on directly on, on what you describe say in no particular order, but near and dear to my heart, the ANS Road to Economic Prosperity Action Plan, and you'll be seeing our colleagues from the ANS Road to Economic Prosperity in early April. So through our work with the ANS communities, one of those three pillars uh, of the, the ANS to Road to Prosperity Plan is fully around connection to employment, entrepreneurship, business opportunities and trade. And through that, we've stood up uh, with the support of RBC and the pr provincial government and always HRM, um, the ANS Connector Program. 
and our colleagues who run that program are working very closely with uh, various trades and our post-secondaries to ensure that uh, our young ANS community members see themselves. They can see themselves in their path to success in a variety of sectors, but with a, um, a focus on the trades. Then also, now in its 14th year, I believe, um, our traditional connector program, which uh, Robin oversees with her team. Um, this program uh, has changed the lives of thousands of recent grads and newcomers to Halifax and beyond, because it's been rolled out across Nova Scotia and across Canada. And that targets the people that you describe, Councillor. Everyone from being a recent graduate and not knowing what to do next, to someone who's maybe un unemployed, underemployed, or whose career path is, is not serving them. And to address directly the, you know, put your CV in a pile with a thousand others, the Connector program is an intentional networking program that helps um, introduce persons looking for career employment to, um, to contacts in their field of study or area of interest. It's been so interesting over the past almost decade and a half how this program and its needs has turned on its head. When it was devised at the outset, it was very much about paying it forward. It was the right thing to do to give a newcomer, a recent grad, a job opportunity. But now because of the tight labor market, employers are very, very keen to meet um, this uh, aspiring talent, these newcomers and recent grads. So I encourage all of you for when you're speaking to your constituents who are on their own career journey and our team helps connect people from you know, recent grads from college or, or undergrad to senior executives who've moved here from other parts of Canada and the world and everything in between, please encourage them to contact our office. And also, when you're speaking to employers at any stage in their in their career uh, development that they are interested in, in paying it forward and sharing some of their expertise and opening up their personal connections for them to, uh, to get involved as connectors. Thank you. Anything to add, Rob? No, I think you did a, a great coverage of, of all of that. Just uh, wanted to mention that they, we work closely with industry sector councils and when they have like bricklaying or different types of uh, painting, any types of training that's available, um, you know, we pass that along through our social media contacts or messaging as well as um, NPower and uh, Digital Nova Scotia, some of their training programs that are, are ideal for those that really are looking for a career change. There are so many opportunities out there. So happy to uh, address any um, of think your we constituents. Would talk. Yes, <laughs> I'd be happy to. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Mayor. And that answer kind of leads into some of the questions I was going to ask in regards to what c crossover collaboration we need to do, do with the Construction Association of Nova Scotia, the various trade unions and all the uh, Nova Scotia Community College for Trade Certification, uh, our advanced education and labor. You know, uh, there's a, so many partners we could, we could probably engage here, but there has to be some collaboration and cooperation here. So I'm trying to figure out how this is gonna dovetail into all that. You know, for instance, the journeyman mentorship, you know, they have to go from ratio one to one to perhaps a two to one to a three to one to get certification for, for these um, new trainees. And I'm also concerned about the uh, the workplace safety training that's going to be required because we've, we're we're having too many accidents and deaths recently in, in the industry and the construction industry, and we got to make sure that newcomers are aware of the safety codes and regulations we have over here. But I'm curious. In one part of the report here, talks about a municipal housing corporation or a community land trust establishment. I'm kind of curious if you have any comment to say about that. Thank you. Your Worship, through to Councillor Hensby. So very briefly, and you'll be hearing more in two weeks' time from our ANS colleagues, the um, 
specifically the land trust piece is uh, from our lens at Halifax Partnership, something that has been raised uh, within our work with African Nova Scotia communities uh, and led by community. So I'll, I'll defer to, to them to speak to their plans in that area. Um, and work has not been done or conversations been had to date um, from my lens with HRM staff specifically about that municipal uh, piece, um, but that would be something that we would explore as a part of this work. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Outhead. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Wendy, for being here. Um, I sit here sort of chuckling because I remember back in 2008, there's a gentleman named Jim McNiven, and Jim came to Nova Knowledge and he said, you realize we're about 10 to 12 years away from a workforce crisis like we've never seen. Not only do we have people retiring, but we don't have them training for the right jobs of the future. <laughs> and of course, that was IT, that was skilled trades, it was ever. So I kidded Ray, Ray Evany when he brought through his report. I said, good Nova Knowledge report, Ray, because he used to attend those and facilitate those, as did your, press, your predecessors. Um, and here we are. And back then we said the solutions was immigration, education, and long, lifelong learning. Sound familiar? Um, so, um, it is comforting to hear though that some of the reasons, uh, some of our shortage of housing is as a result of labor shortages and skills shortage, not just council taking too long to approve things as, as, some, uh, as some might have us believe. Um, and also, I think there are supply issues too. And I don't know if, how much you could, I don't know if any of us can do much about that, but uh, the, the supplies uh, for even the projects that are going ahead have been quite a change. One of the things I always say, Wendy, and I'll say it again today, is that I don't like silos and I don't like duplication. And I'm not suggesting that is happening, but I'm suggesting I don't want it to happen. And is there not some funding opportunity available here from the province? Is there not people already doing this on behalf of the province? We know that most of the immigrants, not all, but most of the immigrants and many of the construction jobs are going to be in HRM. But, you know, there's a role for the province in this. And they may have those expert. They may have those ex that expertise in place now. They may have people doing this. Uh, I agree with Way that we could probably spend more than a couple hundred grand, and it would be nice if there was another funding source. So, just just your thoughts on that. Thank you, and uh, from your worship to Councillor Outhead, uh, which also addresses Way's uh, yeah. mention about the budget is the. The reason that we're able to proceed uh, with a $200,000 budget for a pilot for a year is because of the leverage funding that's already in place. And um, it is uh, a bit of a history of how this came to be. It's, uh, it is an action, this, this activity is an action within People, Planet, Prosperity. It's Action 42 within the Economic Growth Strategy to proactively attract yeah. the labor needed for HRM. Um, we, uh, in our recent travels, um, which was in collaboration with the province, representative, representatives from um, the regional enterprise networks from throughout the province were there as well and will continue to travel to promote their region, the specific culture and flavor of their area, as well as the specific job needs of their employers. So this brings HRM to the table along with these other partners. Also from a federal leverage lens, so even when Robin recently traveled to the Destination, uh, Destination Canada Fair in Europe and Northern Africa, that was funded in large part by the federal government. So the, that the very important pieces of our other partners um, is absolutely critical to the success. We're already working with them. This helps us fully participate with them in a way that without that staff resource, we're just simply not participating in the initiatives that they're setting up as HRM. Thank you. And, and that's good. I, I mentioned this before. I just have a minute here that some friends of ours in, in Malagash came here from Germany and they started several businesses and they had children who couldn't speak English and then their children started winning the English prize 
in uh, Pugla Pugwash High School. I always found that amusing. When they went to the um, embassy in, in uh, Berlin, and I called Elizabeth Mills about this at the time, they were said, why would you want to come to Nova Scotia, go to Alberta and Ontario and BC? That's where all the action is. So let's make sure that's not happening. While you want to partner with those, those federal and provincial people, and we want to take their money, but you also have to carve out, I hope, and, you're, and I'm preaching to the choir here, I know, but the benefits of Nova Scotia and HRM. So, yeah, just it was a bad experience in my, and, and I know Elizabeth Mills wasn't too happy either. So, anyway, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> just before I go to Councillor Mason to, to close, <clears throat> I had a question similar to Councillor Outhitz. I'm, uh, you know, I brought this forward because I think we have to do something here in, in the city, but it, it does strike me a little um, unfortunate <clears throat> that this is traditionally a provincial responsibility, recruitment and retention. We have a advanced labour and advanced education. And um, at a point in time when provincial governments seem to be floating in money and all municipalities are struggling, um, I think we do need to make sure. I, I, in the report, it, it mentions the leveraging of the Connector program, but have you had discussions with the province specifically around supporting us as this group that will be the partnership, it'll be the construction association, and other people in the development industry, will they help to fund some of that as we get this thing going? Thank you, Mayor. So we're in ongoing conversations with uh, the province as a whole, um, labor, labor skills and immigration specifically, uh, about broader funding envelope for HRM and specifically for the partnership to do this and other economic development initiatives. Um, with thanks to the province, they currently fund directly our existing labor programs, or the majority of our existing labor programs, including the Connector, ANS Connector, and Atlantic Immigration Program. So they are in in a big way for those and have just uh, reconfirmed their support for the upcoming uh, upcoming fiscal year, um, and we're in ongoing dialogue on how they can continue to assist in this more proactive work. I'll also mention, because we haven't mentioned it yet, our Living in Halifax Toolkit, which the province also helped create, and these are marketing materials that speak specifically to what it is to live, work, and play here in HRM from the lens of a newcomer. We know that when you make a decision to leave your country, your home, to come to a a new country, a new community that you maybe know very little about. These are big plays. This is a big decision. And having um, inspiring employment is just one piece. It's where are you moving to? And the province did help us in, in funding to create those marketing materials that not only do we use ourselves, but we share with employers. So when they're out there to talk about their employment opportunities, they're able to set that stage for what it means to, to live here in HRM. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll just say one other thing. <clears throat> I was with Robin in a city in Spain last year that has had growth but doesn't want to grow anymore, but has skilled workers that they think would be fine to come to places like Halifax. And so targeting those kind of places and bringing people here, even if it's only for two or three years, which maybe gets us over the hump, um, I know that the kind of work that Robin and her team uh, have been doing. So thank you. Councillor Mason, take us home. Thank you to close because I have this opportunity and I'm going to do it. Uh, it was great on International Women's Day to attend a dinner that was uh, Atlantic Business Magazine's uh, award recognizing the 25 most powerful women in business in 2023. Wendy Luther is one of those women. Ooh. I'd like to thank her. But I also, as I was looking this up to make sure I got it right, there's Joyce Carter right behind her who was also one of the most powerful women in business in 2023. And it's, uh, uh, I, I can't promise Wendy as your friend that I won't keep bringing it up at inappropriate times. Uh, I think this was an appropriate time, and, uh, uh, but uh, so I wanted to make sure that it was acknowledged. So thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the work you're doing on this file. And uh, <clears throat> the guest speaker at that dinner was, I can't remember, was counselor, former counselor, former mayor, Glory McCluskey, was the keynote address at that. Uh, so Wayne and I were privileged to be there for that. Ready for the question, colleagues? Can't, uh, that's carried. Thank you very much, uh, Wendy and Robin. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, we will move to our second item that we've moved up, which is 1515. This is the Halifax International Airport Authority. 
Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I put the motion on the floor that Halifax Regional Council direct staff to, one, provide 365 days notice to, of termination to the Halifax International Airport Association as per section 2.3 of the existing taxation agreement and Two, enter into negotiations with HIAA with an, the intent to have a new taxation agreement in place effective March 31st, 2024 for the fiscal year of 2024 and 25 years. So moved. So uh, thank you uh, for the second. Uh, you know, Mr. Mayor, it's interesting. Um, you know, the Halifax Partnership by being here to talk about talent, recruiting talent. When the partnership was out uh, recruiting businesses to uh, HRM, they talk about a lot of things. They talk about uh, the talent, they talk about our great universities, they talk about our diversity, they talk about our lifestyle, our green space, they talk about Burnside, they talk about our port, and, and they talk about our airport, and the list goes on and on. But the airport is part of that, for, without, without question. You know, this pandemic in these chambers, the last couple of years, we've spoken a lot about organizations and businesses that have struggled because of the pandemic. And particularly, we look at our restaurants and our bars and our hotels and our retail operations. We're hammered during the pandemic. And some of those businesses actually closed the doors. Some of them, even though we've had a good year, last a good summer, the last couple of summers are not bad, it, it's, it's helped. Some of these businesses still are struggling because they got so behind because of the pandemic. I would put into that category our airport. I think our airport not only struggling as equally as some of those businesses I mentioned, those sectors I mentioned, but probably even more so. You take a look at the airport right now in 2020, they had a deficit of 40 million. 2021, they had a deficit of 35 million. They had to borrow $150 million just to get through the pandemic. Their expectation uh, is that, you know, by 2025, we'll get back to pre-pandemic numbers. You know, I look at the, this motion today, and I, and I agree this motion today, we need to be discussing it. When we look at the taxes, you look at Toronto, for example, Pearson Airport, you know, they, it's 94 per cents per passenger. Well, we've all been through Pearson, they should be paying us for anything. That's another story, <laughs> that's another story altogether. But you look at Ottawa, you know, it's $1.8 per passenger. And here in Halifax, it's 22 cents. So I agree that number doesn't make sense. And there's a lot to that to unravel, and I think some of my colleagues will speak to that in a moment. Uh, but I really think that, yes, we need to address that, but I don't believe this is the time to address this. This motion that we have in front of us today says give notice for 365 days. Um, I, I believe we need to delay this. Well, I'd like to put a motion on the floor now that we defer this motion uh, to March 2024. And at that point in time, let's look at the numbers. Let's look at where we're going. And at that time, let's have the debate. And there's a lot more information that we need. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll put the motion on the floor that we defer the motions on the floor today to March uh, uh, 2024. That's seconded by Councillor Daigle Gammon. So the motion to defer is on the floor. So, um, my mic back. Thank you. Um, so not much more to say. I'd like to hear from my colleagues on this. Uh, again, I repeat. I think the the number is uh, is too low. Uh, at the same time, we have to look at where we are. We have to look at what's going on in the city. There, I go back to the conversation that the partnership just had with us. Now is not the time to add uh, the, uh, the our burden to the the airport. Yes, we need money, but absolutely, as the mayor said. Province seems to be shaking the cushions and the couch and finding all kinds of funds. We've already shaken our, the cushions in our couch, and it's empty right now. So we need to continue to support our business community, which means supporting our airport. And I, I'd like you to hear what you, my colleagues have to say, but looking to defer this. Let's have this conversation in a year's time. At that point in time, we have more stats. At that point in time, we can decide. Let's give notice then. So uh, thank you. Look forward to everyone's comments. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I don't see the point in kicking the, the can down the road for a year because essentially that's what this motion does. The airport won't pay a single cent more for the next year. Not one penny more, because we're giving notice and we're going to negotiate. We already know we're subsidizing. Uh, if you look at any other organization that would pay property taxes on similar property, 
they would pay more than what the airport's paying. So what does that mean? It means we're subsidizing greenhouse gas emissions disproportionately when at a, at a time of a climate crisis, we should be pricing carbon more appropriately. Airlines uh, emit because of their elevation and the way you travel and the weight of the, 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 the jet, emit more per passenger than any other mode of transportation. Uh, we have, if my math is correct, each of us have about 50 tons of carbon to emit in our lifetime if we want to keep to the one and a half degree global warming commitment. If you were to fly, say, 13, 14 hours there and back, go on a vacation, that's about five tons of carbon in a plane Hawaii. per person. For example, if someone went to Hawaii and back. Uh, that's 10% of your lifetime carbon emissions for that one flight there and back. So why would we want to subsidize that? Why would we want to make that easier for people? I just don't see the point to that. I think every opportunity we have to price carbon appropriately, to make it more difficult for people to be such large emitters of carbon when we're facing this climate crisis is what we need to do. So let's say we sit down, we give notice today, we sit down and we start negotiating and it goes up by a few cents or a, f a couple of bucks. Well, fine. But why would we want to delay that for another year before we even start talking about what more appropriate uh, property taxes would be for that organization? So I'm not in favor of deferring. I'm in favor of saying, okay, we should have done better when we looked at the renegotiation we had a few years ago. Uh, I don't recall in that staff report at the time uh, it's saying that you know the fee had been so low uh, for so long and we should increase it. Uh, and that's our bad. But we have an opportunity now to fix that. And so I think this is the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councillor Cleary, for always always giving me something to chew on. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I think that there, there's two things going on here. There's like the, there's the municipal taxation piece, and then of course, you know, there's the climate change piece. And I, I, I don't, I'm not, you know, there's a lot we have to do in climate change, but I'm not convinced that the way to do that is to, you know, kind of up property taxes as some kind of carbon tax. Um, well, we've upped them across the board as a climate tax for, to pay for our for our actions. But I'm not convinced, like you know, deliberately going after one specific property to say, well, you know, your emissions are this, and therefore, you know, we're we're going to we're not going to we're not going to negotiate in the same sort of way with you. Um, like I, I don't think that that's necessarily the way to go. I, I was a little uncomfortable in the front with this from the get go, and based on the feedback that has come, um, I, I'm in favor at this point of deferring. Um, the thing that I find a little tough on this one is um, the idea that, you know, that we're barely into a 20-year agreement and now we're saying, oh, well, you know what, uh, our bad, we messed up on negotiations and now we want to rip up the agreement. I mean, how can anyone take you seriously as an honest a broker if uh, the, that's <laughs> if barely out of the gate, you're suggesting the agreement's flawed. Um, you know, I think spending some more time on this um, and, you know, on the per passenger fee piece, um, yes, it's lower. There's also the other pieces that, you know, we have guaranteed income in a way that other places don't. Um, you know, if we are, if we want a higher share of the, pa of the passenger income, that passenger fee, well, I, I think, you know, not to negotiate in public, but it would also be fair for us to take on more of the risk because our revenues did not go down, still did not go down from that revenue the way they did would have in the other cities. So uh, I'm okay with deferring this uh, for now, um, especially where the airport has, um, you know, taken on a, a whack of debt. And uh, certainly there's uh, climate change pieces that need to be worked on there. Um, but I don't think we're going to, I, I don't think, unduly um, punishing the airport is the way to go on um, to achieve those objectives. Thank you. 
Thank you. Councillor Hensby. Thank you much, Mr. Mayor, and uh, I concur with the statement that Councillor De Deputy Mayor Austin said, you know, we're just not even five years into a 20-year agreement, and I think that it might be too premature to, to look at terminating it at this present time, but I'm just kind of curious to know is, do we have to terminate the agreement just to amend the tax rate in it? Is it as simple like that? Can we just do an amendment to the, to the agreement, or does it have to be terminated totally? And also, uh, as we knew in the beginning, when the airport authority was first established, the federal government put a lot of investments in other airports across the country, but very little investment in, in, into Halifax at the time, and Halifax took on a load of burden and, and debt to upgrade the airport with, um, with a great deal of success, but not with the ability of having partnership funding as it did elsewhere, and other airports did. But I'm curious, as the airport builds up more and more and builds up more and more, the assessment base uh, increases as well. So is that base tax of $529,000, is that capped at that plus the CPI? Or is the, as the assessment base up there grows, does that tax base grow with it? Or is that capped at the time of the um, agreement entered with Transport Canada? So I'd like to know if, you know, how much the assessment base has grown from the time it was originally signed to what it is now. And could that also be adjusted in any agreement? I'd just kind of like to know in regards to uh, why should an agreement be terminated if it only just needs an amendment? CAO. Uh, my understanding of that agreement is we could not adjust the rate unilaterally because it is an agreement. So we would need to have the airport in agreement with that, do it through discussion, and then get it approved by council. With respect to the um, increase, in, increase in assessment values, um, the increase in assessment values over the last five years has resulted in a fairly significant increase in the level of subsidization. The difference between what the airport is paying versus what uh, normal tax times assessment would be. And with spe respect to the impact on the base, I'll let Jerry come forward and speak to that piece. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Chair Blackwood, CFO. Uh, in the original agreement that started out, I believe the uh, the base was somewhere in the five hundred thousand dollar range. I think it's up around six hundred or six hundred and fifty thousand now. That's the amount that increases by by CPI uh, each year. But the assessment base out there has not shown any adjustment in that payment as well. Uh, the assessment base at the airport is just like any other property, it's assessed at market value, uh, uh, commercial market value. Uh, it has the, the, the assessments have increased uh, over the years, obviously, uh, with, with respect to capital investments and uh, just a regular trend in, in commercial assessment. Thank you. The only thing I'd like to add, Mr. Mayor, in regards to, uh, I've always been saying that our our municipal properties around the Aerotech Park, I really believe we should be handing those lands over to the airport, let them build the, build on upon them. They have the asset base out there. They need the, they need the land around them, and I think the Aerotech Park is uh, is uh, sitting on their doorstep, and I think that they should be having the the, late, the ability to control and develop those lands. So that's my been my opinion. Perhaps that can come under a separate agreement, but. Uh, I think they should be given more leverage and more levers. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cuttle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this, this is a tricky one because we know how important the airport is to our region and what a critical role it plays in our economy, in our tourism industry, in, um, you know, people being able to access our municipality for, for leisure or visiting or anything else. It's one, it's, you know, it's a key asset. Um, and I appreciate that the airport is being squeezed and that the pandemic was, um, was tough on the airport. Um, you know, HRM is being squeezed and our residents are being squeezed as well. And the reason that we're here is because we're looking for ways to, um, lessen the tax burden on all of our res residents, and we all have to pay our share. HRM is taking on a burden, 
our residents are taking on a burden. And I think, you know, looking at our airport to take a share of that burden as well is not an unreasonable, it's not an unreasonable ask. Um, you know, like, as, like it's already been mentioned, this is just giving notice for 365 days. In the staff report, it says that staff will do um, a cross-jurisdictional scan on the taxation structures in place at other Canadian airports and will, and will recommend revised terms that provide slow, predictable growth in municipal tax revenues that are equitable when compared to other airports and taxpayers. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I do trust that staff aren't going to come back with something that's not doable for the airport, that, that these things will be considered, particularly around, you know, the, the slow and predictable piece of, of increasing and in increasing the, uh, the charges there. Um, you know, in, in the letter from the airport, um, you know, businesses pay for things like solid waste all across our municipality, not just the airport. I mean, businesses have to pay for commercial tax, um, commercial um, waste removal. Um, Multi-unit residentials have to pay for waste removal. Institutions have to pay for it too. So it's not something that's that's a that's a given to all businesses, and and it's not just the roads at the airport that need to be considered. It's all the roads connecting to the airport that also matter, right? It's the it's the network in its entirety and you know really we have to be working cooperatively and in lockstep to make all of these things you know I'll, I'll make our city work in that way make our transportation systems work in that way so i you know i don't think looking at things in silos is is um, a particularly useful discussion there um, i would hope that the new agreement that if we do vote to approve this, and in 365 days we you know, enter into negotiations that look at a, a slow and predictable increase, that we also look at perhaps mechanisms for relief should another pandemic hit. Um, you know, to the point that was made in, in um, the letter from the, from the airport, um, HIAA, um, other airports, when the pandemic hit and they and they had the loss of passengers, there was some re relief, some tax relief provided, but that that wasn't in the agreement for our airport. And I don't think this is something people were predicting. We weren't like thinking that you know there's going to be this massive pandemic that's going to affect us for so for so long um, that that such a thing would even be considered. But now we know that this does happen, and um, and I don't know you know if that is something that could be considered in the new uh, agreement, but I think that would only, that would only be fair. Um, you know, it's noted that profits, that the airport is looking at becoming profitable again in 2024 and, and hopefully returning to pre-pandemic, fingers crossed, by 2025. So, you know, I do think now is the time to, to look at this. I think that, you know, it's, again, it's 365 days away. Um, there is a it's, a, it's a new agreement and, you know, it's really making sure that it's a fair new agreement um, across the board for everyone and that the, you know, the, the squeeze that we're all feeling um, is evenly distributed and not just on, on the backs of our residents. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Diego Gammon. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Mayor. Um, Interesting conversation just before this started, you know, Councillor Mancini came down and said, I want to do this motion for a, a deferral. And I, I probably would have said that in the same way, but maybe I would have said until the airport is in a better financial position, um, not even to give it a year, but to wait. I think we have to remember that um, HIA is a nonprofit. And during COVID in an empty airport, we still had them pay taxes based on the previous year's passenger count, um, and we didn't give any relief. Other airports did have relief across Canada uh, for COVID. We didn't, and HIA still paid the same amount. And people get hung up a little bit on the 22 cents per passenger, but there's also that base rate plus the passenger count 
plus they pay for all other services. So when you compare, and we say we'll do a jurisdictional scan, but when you compare one airport to another to another, you're not always comparing the same thing. It's not apples to apples, it's not oranges to oranges. What one airport pays and what another airport does is very different based on their agreements. And I agree that you know a 20-year agreement and you know signed in 2018 came into effect in 2019, so we're only four years into it. Um, and in the middle of that, you got COVID and $150 million debts. So whether you know if the airport gets to be profitable by 2024, profitable but still paying on that debt. So you have to look at the entire financial statement. I think you can't just look at one piece of it and say that we're going to be okay. Um, the very interesting piece I find, you know, came from uh, Patrick Sullivan in the letter from the Chamber of Commerce I thought was pretty interesting. Um, he articulates it really well in terms of, you know, we want to attract people. We talk about cities. How many cities have you flown into and, and really the airport that you've flown into is part of the reputation of that city. And so this is part of our reputation as well and, you know, if, if we end up uh, with an agreement in this moment in time when they're still in debt. That means they cut services. That means that they cut things that are going to affect the reputation of that airport and how well we service people coming into our city, so uh, into HRM. So I think that that's a really big uh, point that we need to consider. Um, the lovely letter that came, and uh, you know, maybe a little bit biased, I guess, um, from the Atlantic Canada Airports Association in the same way. I mean, they are a federal body that looked at everything and said, this airport is being treated differently. Um, so um, we didn't give any allowance for the declining in passenger traffic. I don't know if you guys remember some of those um, TV commercials or some of the stuff that happened and, and the airport was a ghost town and they were shutting down lights and shutting down power in different parts of the airport just to make things more balanced. So they've lived a different reality during COVID than a lot of other businesses have as well, right? So I, I do, I, I think that this is not the time. I think that we need to give the airport some time to get into a better place before we start looking at this agreement again. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mason. Thank you, Mayor. I wasn't gonna speak, but just briefly, if we defer this, it means we debate it again in a year. So it's not like we're making a final decision. So we will get that information that Councillor Jacob Gammon was asking about, or we'll have a better idea. I'm sure we'll get another letter from Joyce at that point telling us whether you're at those numbers or not. And you know, I think it's laudable for us to talk about uh, having moderate uh, average fees uh, compared to national uh, parameters, recognizing how hard it is to do that with this uh, because of all the different uh, agreements in terms of services and taxes across the country. I don't know that we're anywhere near uh, a moderate, you know, 50% of the national average or 75% of the national average uh, uh, based on what I've seen, but but I think that's a discussion that we can have later because my my discomfort is knowing that we're not back up to the pre-COVID levels uh, of uh, transportation and, and the impact that has on revenue for the airport. So I'll be supporting the deferral. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Arthur. Thank you, Mayor. And I think I'll be supporting the deferral. Uh, and we also, you know, when this first came forward, we almost had a predetermined outcome and then we did amend that where we thought how much money, you know, could be raised or this was, I, mean, I wasn't comfortable with that. Um, maybe this was in a report and, I, and I'm sorry, I, I don't uh, recall this, but we have talked about the 22 cents, we've talked about the flat, uh, the fee as well. Has anybody, and, and Kathy or, or uh, Jerry, has anybody on the back of the napkin done the math? Maybe Sean's gonna talk about this next, but what, what happens when you look at the flat rate to, to that 22 cents per, per people? Do we narrow the gap? Because when you look at 98 cents versus 22 cents, there's a bit of sticker shock there. But when you look at the, the, the flat fee or the taxes on that, has anybody done that math? Or did I just miss it? Yeah, there was there was an estimate provided in, okay. in the briefing note and <clears throat> the range was given was between, you know, one and two million dollars, right? So what this would be would be a negotiation similar to what we've, you know, done before with respect to Citadel Hill with right. the Port of Halifax. So, uh, you know, the, eco the two economic proxies in uh, for revenue uh, for what the airport would pay would be the flat amount right. and uh, the 22 cents. So 
uh, again, depending on how a negotiation went, uh, that sure. those would be the two pieces that were on the table. I don't know if there's any other types of economic proxies out there right now, but it seems to be passenger count is the one that, uh, you know, through staff's research, that, that is the most commonly used to tax airport authorities. Right, and that would have bitten us on the you-know-what probably during the pandemic, which is a fair comment. But what I, sorry, Jerry, my question was, if you factor in the, the money that, that's played on the taxes, what does that do to the 0 0.22? Does anybody figured out how many passengers pay the point that the, the uh, I'm not explaining this very well, but we're saying we pay a base price, a base tax plus the 22 cents. So when you put those two things together, divide it by the number of passengers, what does the 0 0.22 jump to? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have, I have that. That's key. Um, it is, they have been provided in, in the uh, yeah. reporting, yeah, so I, it's some I, quick math, we could, we could certainly yeah. do one. Maybe that. that jumps it to 50 or 40 or 98 or it, I, I just It would probably, if you, if you factored it into the passenger count, yeah, yeah, it would probably maybe bump it up uh, 20 cents maybe. Okay, yeah. all right, so that's it. So it's still low, but not quite the sticker shock of the... The point twenty two is my point, but anyway, we'll see where this goes. I think the mayor might have a thought on this, so I'll let him go next. <laughs> thank you, thank, thank, deputy. Thank you, uh, thank you, Councillor Outhead, and the mayor uh, is up next. Thank, thank you, uh, thank you, deputy mayor. Yeah, I'll, I'll support the deferral. I didn't like when this came up in the budget process. To me, this never should have been a budget issue to come in on fiscal at the very end of the process and hold a million to two million dollars out there when we're all looking for money. <clears throat> this is about economic development with an economic implication and not the other way around. And I wasn't real keen on that. I understand why finance folks were doing that because they saw an opportunity to reduce the tax rate. <clears throat> but I wasn't keen on that. And the other thing I said there that I stand by is it kind of turns us into an us versus the airport. I spent 10 years working with the airport. Joyce and I have traveled abroad promoting Halifax and the airport as well as other parts of our municipality. And keep in mind, you know, that that base amount goes up by CPI. Mm -hmm. So if that follows this year, then Halifax International Airport will go up by more than any other single taxpayer in the municipality. If we don't reach CPI in terms of our, which we won't, um, we won't, this, this would be the single biggest increase, I think, that anybody would pay unless there's some PILT arrangement I'm not aware of. <clears throat> the other thing is it's 22 cents a passenger. Um, you know, it, it, it's a lot more passengers than it used to be. So the, the tax that the airport has paid has gone up. And it's also worth keeping in mind that during COVID, they paid 22 cents a passenger on 4,188,000 passengers, including when they only had a million passengers. So, <clears throat> you, know, we're, uh, you know, it's a not-for-profit. Sometimes people forget, so are we. Uh, mm -hmm. The people who are writing letters that forget <laughs> that we're a not-for-profit as well, right? We have all the same pressures. Um, but I think it's a matter, you know, taxes should be fair and reasonable and transparent. Um, <clears throat> and I didn't like this idea that we have to send this notice in by March 28th. It doesn't have an impact on the upcoming budget, but it does the following um, year. But I think it makes some sense to defer this and to negotiate it. And I think uh, I'll ask uh, Kathy, our CAO, I mean, we could negotiate that floor. We don't have to have the floor where it is either. If we open up the renegotiation, we could take into account future issues. Hopefully we're not going to have a pandemic, but in the case of any other significant event, we could negotiate that floor to the benefit of the airport. That's correct. And, uh, you know, coming back to the municipality and looking at this 20-year agreement, it's different than some of the past agreements we've had with HIAA, but it didn't strike me that the format of the agreement was particularly beneficial to either the airport or the municipality. I think we could collectively do better. Yeah. So I'll, su I'll support this deferral. Um, I'm not sure that you have to wait till next March to start negotiating for the following year. I know you and Joyce know each other and we'll have had discussions as I've had discussions with, with, uh, with Joyce in the past. Um, and we need more information and we all know that. Uh, we could get that. Um, but you know, for example, we're told the per passenger rate for Toronto and Ottawa, but they don't pay a base rate. So to Tim's point, to Council Outhead's point, like what is that base rate worth in terms of a, a per passenger? It's like everything else in property taxation. It's really convoluted and difficult. And so I, I know the work that Jerry and his team are putting into it. But the airport 
is a huge partner in the growth of this city. Um, it's been well led. We have members on the board uh, who have done a great job. The whole board has, in my view. It's been free of a lot of the, you know, um, you know politics and all the things of the, of the far past. Um, <clears throat> so we are a not-for-profit. I think there's a, something here that we could find that I think would be a win-win for us and for the airport uh, if we take the time and, uh, you know, and do it. People do need to remember, we don't have a lot of money either. Um, but how we do this and how we work with our partners is important to us. I support the deferral. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, next up is Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so really good conversation. I, I appreciate the deferral uh, uh, motion and, and the intent of it. I, I disagree with the timing. I think part of the problem is we're doing this at the end of fiscal discussions. Not helpful, right? We should be having this conversation uh, ongoing, as, as, as Mayor Savage has just alluded to. The problem, I think, was that it came to us and uh, it was like a bowl of candy, <laughs> right? And also, uh, you know, it, it was, we're looking at a comparative analysis that really isn't apples to apples, uh, you know, nationally. And so I, 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 I do think that, I do think that we kind of skewed the conversation a little bit at our previous uh, discussion. And so I, I'm in favor of the deferral, but I don't agree with the fact that we should wait um, until you know next March to have this discussion. Having it during their fiscal uh, conversations, I think would be inappropriate and irresponsible. The airport is an economic development tool and we need to ensure that it has everything that it needs in order to succeed. That being said, uh, this was negotiated prior to COVID. And so having an opportunity for all of us to sit down and renegotiate this contract to the benefit of both parties, I think would be beneficial and we should not wait until March uh, 2020. Uh, for to do that, the reality is any changes wouldn't come to play until 2025, 26. We have no idea uh, if we're going to have another pandemic, or if we're going to get out of this one, or what's going to happen. So I would think the sooner that uh, that Joyce and and our CAO Kathy are at the table talking about how to move forward uh, to benefit both parties of of this agreement. Uh, would be beneficial to all. And I, I really don't think it's about the 22 cents. I think our previous discussion was about the 22 cents, but I think that, uh, like I said, was a bowl of candy uh, <laughs> at a bad time <laughs> when, when we're desperately looking for funds. Uh, so that being said, I'm happy with the deferral, um, but you know, I, I do think we, we need to have those conversations sooner than later. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm, I'm a little confused based on the, the comments I've heard from everyone say, let's, let's talk about a new deal, let's talk about a renegotiation, but let's defer terminating or giving notice of termination of this agreement. You, you can't negotiate a new agreement unless you give notice of terminating the current agreement. You can't say, well, we might at some point in the future, next year, ter give notice of termination, which would actually take us to uh, 2025 because you have to give the one year notice. So like, you don't think a year notice is enough time to get the facts, negotiate? We don't say to our you know, employee union groups, uh, you know what, I know your contract is coming due, but we got a lot of data to gather. We'll start negotiating in a year or two. There's, there's, there's mandatory timelines for renegotiating when collective agreements expire. This, uh, so if you don't give notice, you can't negotiate a new agreement. The other thing was, I agree with Councillor Cuddle, we, everyone's got to pay their fair share. Your residents, our residents in each of our districts are paying more taxes right now than they need to because the airport is paying less. We are subsidizing the airport versus what it would pay in taxes if it was assessed and we tax the assessment. And I talked about the environment already, but I'm going to add this one. Uh, Mr. Blackwood, could you confirm, because of the agreement that we have with the airport, when we brought in the Halifax 3% tax, did that apply to the airport? Uh, thank you, Councillor Cleary. No, uh, it would not apply to the airport. So one of the largest emitters of greenhouse gases does not play, pay the climate action tax of 3%. I, I mean, that's ironic in the, in the highest degree. So. 
I'm not sure what you guys are waiting for. Let's not defer. Let's give notice of termination. We have a year to sit down. Everyone keeps saying, Kathy and Joyce, sit down. They're not going to unless we give notice of termination. So I don't know why you'd want to defer this for a whole year when it's going to take another year after that point. So you're deferring it for two years. Even by giving notice now, we're deferring it for a year because we have to give a year's notice. Anyway, uh, you guys do what you want, but the best course of action for us, financial, uh, our own financial sustainability, for our residents' financial sustainability, for environmental sustainability, is to give notice of termination and renegotiate starting ASAP. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councilor Morris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I don't support the deferral either, um, and the reason is, I don't think the deal that we're talking about that was negotiated a few years ago was a good deal for HRM. And now we're asking our residents to continue to subsidize the airport at a much lower rate than many other airports in Canada. And we're asking our residents to subsidize a highly polluting luxury good. And I think we have to change our perspective on, on things uh, a little bit in terms of what this is. It, yes, it is an economic generator, but it's also a luxury good, as far as I'm concerned, so I can't support it. Thank you. Councillor Purdy. Mr. Mayor, and uh, I uh, felt uncomfortable with this at, in our budget meeting uh, as well, just, the, just fundamentally, the, the fact that you can break an agreement, you know, four years into a 20-year agreement, just something about that does not sit right with me. Um, I, I will be supporting the deferral. I mean, this is a good conversation. I really appreciate hearing all the different points of view. Um, but I don't know, the airport economic, uh, not only economic generator, all, all of the comments that were said, it is it is important um, mm. uh, to, to support our airport, I, I believe. And um, so I will be supporting the deferral, but not <laughs> to uh, to the end goal of breaking the agreement, but to get more information, hopefully, and um, see where we're at when this comes up again. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. So, Mr. Mayor, I just have to ask the question, Mr. Blackwood, why is the airport not contributing to the three percent? So, <clears throat> with. Okay, I think it's important to clarify a couple of things here. So yes. the commercial leases at the Halifax International Airport, so I'm talking about uh, Tim Hortons, uh, other food establishments, Clearwater, for example, they would pay the regular taxation like any other commercial business, okay? The Halifax International Airport Authority the group that, the nonprofit that runs the airport, they pay based on a tax agreement. Yes. And the economic proxy yeah. that we tax on is passenger count, Excellent. as well as, as a base amount. As the a, base a, amount was the old PILT amount when the, the airport was run by uh, Transport Canada, when, it, when the, the airport was under the Payment in Lieu of Taxes Act. All right, thank you. So I think that's a really important clarification because it's not just the, a, a blanketed statement that nobody at the airport is paying like other businesses. Um, so I just wanted to be really clear on that because it, it just uh, seemed that um, the statement was that they are not paying the 3% when in actual fact, like every other business, whether you're in Burnside or Hammonds Plains, uh, you are contributing uh, under um, your lease agreement to, uh, to to have that space at the airport. That being said, um, the HIAA is not probably similar to other nonprofit organizations across the municipality, which also are not uh, contributing to that three percent. Is that correct? Do I have that right? Other nonprofits would pay the the. Th the uh, the climate action tax. They would. Okay. They would. Uh, so now some nonprofits are part of our HRM's uh, grant program where of they course. get get a get That's a rebate different. on their property taxes. Yes, of course. Okay, so for clarification, it is due to the agreement that we currently have. Yes. 
That's correct, Thank with you. the exception of commercial leases. Right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to clear that up. Okay. Ready for the, this is Councilor Mace, uh, Mancini's deferral motion. We ready for the question on that? The deferral carries, thank you. All right, colleagues, we're gonna move ahead to our, our next uh, item. We've dealt with 15.14 and 15.15. 15.1.1 is appointment of a development of officers, which passed on consent. 15.12 is uh, Lister Drive uh, surplus property passed on consent. We'll move to 1513. This is Provincial Municipal Memoranda of Understanding concerning homelessness. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll put the motion on the floor. I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 direct the Chief Administrative Officer to explore on behalf of the municipality bilateral or multilateral memoranda of understanding to support homeless and precariously housed individuals and increase housing supply. And two, direct the CAO to return to Council with an MOU negotiation report outlining the nature of the proposed collaboration, what the parties hope to achieve, and how desired results are to be reached. Second. Second, Lots of Councillor Blackburn. <laughs> Councillor Lovelace. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. So, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that this recommendation is coming outside of that provincial municipal service exchange agreement and those nego negotiations mm -hmm. which are currently taking place. And, you know, I, I, I did request a staff report on those negotiations. We will be receiving that and an update uh, on those uh, negotiations. You know, as you know, there are no elected representatives um, at the table for that service exchange agreement. So homelessness is kind of uh, outside of all of that in the fact that number one, it falls under the authority of the provincial government. Number two, it is a considerable crisis in our municipality. Um, and uh, I, I must add too that the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness is having their national conference in Halifax mm. this coming November from November 8th to 10th. Uh, so wouldn't it be incredible to be able to have an MOU with the provincial government and the municipality to, to, to work towards ending homelessness in HRM. When I put this motion on the floor, it was after uh, seeing the mayor speak at the annual state of the municipality and after seeing the premier speak at his uh, provincial event talking about the state of the province. And I thought, we're not on the same page here. We have a crisis of homelessness. And when we speak to uh, service providers, there's so many gaps. They're not sure who to speak to. They don't know where to go. They need help. They're on the phone. Is community services gonna help us? Do we go to the housing ministry? Can our counselor help us? Do we talk to staff? We've hired uh, staff uh, specifically to address uh, homelessness. But we have a bigger problem because those numbers are increasing. And as we see the precarity and the increasing of, of homelessness, w the issue isn't so much uh, about whose lane are we in. The issue is there's no policy framework to address homelessness and housing precarity in HRM. And I just, you know, I have to say the staff report talks about the fact that it's non-binding. That's because it's not a contract. This is a policy framework. It's a governance document uh, that will provide us with a path forward uh, to know who's, who's doing what so that we can streamline those services, that we can help those people who need the support. We know that the Housing Task Force is not doing anything on homelessness. That's not their role. And so, you know, you, you look around the room, who, who needs help? Uh, you know, look around the municipality. There's an incredible amount of individuals who are very near to being homeless. And so, you know, we have to look at the continuum. When we talk about homelessness, we have to talk about emergency shelters, transitional housing, social housing, affordability and affordable units, accessible units, et cetera, et cetera. So this, uh, you know, this framework will give us an opportunity to do that. I hope I have your support to move forward because we have got to close the gap and ensure that uh, we stop and end homelessness in HRM. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Kent. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm certainly open to um, such a move. I think it's an important one. We can't not try, is how I feel about it. One of the things that I would like to suggest, though, is that we give consideration, and I see uh, Bill Moore just and, uh, entered the room, so yeah, this is for you, um, <laughs> that, that we have so much going on that intersects with housing and homeless and those unhoused and their experience. And you know, we have a, our public safety strategy that is, this is a huge piece within it. We have the Board of Police Commission work that we're doing in result of the defund report, reimagining how that uh, piece in policing intersects and or can be carved out and looked at differently. Um, you know, we have a motion in council to look at that report and, and, and potentially I think that'll probably land within the public safety strategies piece as well. So that whatever might come out of, should this go forward, might come out of a, an MOU, all of those pieces need to be considered within that, I think. Um, maybe it would be something that is well-defined, or maybe it would be uh, a piece that is, uh, that it must include information, being informed on decisions around the structure of housing, being well-informed on the pieces that we're working on within the municipality, within policing and such. So um, I'm happy to support it. Again, I don't think that it's, it can hurt to, to go down this road. Um, wish I had high hopes, <laughs> I don't, but I'd like to think that maybe if we approach this well and in a way um, which we always have collaboratively, we can, we can convince them um, perhaps our government relations folks are going to be ready to hit the ground running on this as well. I don't think that we, I, uh, sure, I think that we have to do this, kind, take these kinds of steps. And if they say no and they're not interested, then that's on them. We can continue to point that in their direction. Thank you. Okay. Was there a question? There wasn't a question there nope. specifically? Okay. Just want to point out we have Bill Moore. We also have Scott Sheffield with us, who's uh, I think was very involved in negotiating, uh, working on this, as well as Paul Johnson and Denise and others. Uh, Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Council Lovelace, for putting this on the floor. So it's unfortunate that we have to have an MOU to confirm a partnership on homelessness. I mean, that's kind of sad that we that we have to go down this path to get people to get the province to step up with us. However, uh, I, the intent of it, and as Councillor Kent said, you know, we, we should try this. The only thing that I ask, I would like to see is if we get agreement from the province to move forward, and as the report identifies and identifies what we're responsible for, the municipality, and what the province is responsible for, I'd like to see us create some sort of report card that we revisit annually. So once a year we say, here's where we are, here's the check mark. And here's where we're progressing in these areas. We're, we're going the opposite direction. So that's the only thing I would like to support this. If we could add some sort of report card that we both agree on, and I hope they do step up and do this, part, this MOU with us. But when that, part, that report card is revisited here, I'd like to hopefully see our colleagues from the province sitting here with us so we could discuss our, uh, our successes and maybe our failures at the same time together. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cuttle. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, I, I actually think that a, an MOU could have a lot of value, and I, and I, and I, you know, as much, you know, to Councillor Mancini's point that it's sad that we have to have one. It's actually a great thing to have because it gets parties sitting at a table, agreeing to some goals, and we're not doing things ad hoc, right? It really can like set a direction and, and help us all get there. But the key is the, about the willingness to partner, right? You have to, both people have to be sitting down at the table and willing to partner. And, um, you know, I, I really do hope that the province recognizes the, the critical nature of this issue. Um, you know, not just here in HRM, but in other parts of our province as well. And perhaps this can be um, a model for how we can jointly tackle um, these really important these really important issues. I guess my question is, and I don't know who can speak to this, is, you know, right now we have the mobile units, the province is involved in helping provide supports there. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of all those agreements, and I'm just wondering, how is that structured right now? Like, how is that, how is that partnership working? Is it just completely ad hoc on the back of a napkin? Or is there some kind of MOU in place? Or, um, 
you know, minutes of meetings. I, I, I don't really understand how that functions. I don't know if someone can speak to that. I think the term ad hoc would best describe it. There are, you know, some emails, and you have to recall that during, you know, the pandemic, the municipality and the province were moving very quickly to work together on certain issues. And so there is not um, that I've seen any partnership agreements or MOUs that are in existence yet on these matters. Right, okay, so then, you know, perhaps this is an opportunity to look at the success of, you know, our, our initiatives to date and formalize them a little more and, um, and set some, some future goals so we're not just always in a reactive mode, but we can be in a very proactive planning mode and addressing, you know, the, the systemic um, pieces to this, to this issue. Um, you know, I, again, it's not HRM, it's not the province of Nova Scotia, this is an issue across Canada. Um, and, you know, from, from the staff report, we can see that there are all kinds of different ways that municipalities and provinces are tackling this issue. And, you know, I think, I think this is a step in the right direction, and, um, and I, hope that, I hope the province sees it that way too. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hensley. Well, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Mancini said it may be sad, but I think it's necessary. We have a contract or a mem memorandum of understanding with the province. Um, here are we being drawn into housing, social housing, social assistance, whatever the case may be, um, into something that the municipality, we don't, have the, we don't have the provincial mandate here. That's the provincial province responsibility, but we've been drawn into it as a partner. The federal government's given out money left, right, and center for rapid housing initiatives and everything else, funneling it through to the municipalities and stuff. So I think we need to have a, a random, random understanding of what the municipal responsibilities are going to be with this. We provide grants. To, to organizations, we provide tax relief to not-for-profit organizations as well as housing co-ops and everything else like that. We provide a waiver of fees or a reduction of fees for building permits, whatever, 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 any other permits. We're trying to get something with Hellex Water to negotiate uh, perhaps a waiver of some of their fees. Um, you know, I can understand the municipality makes a contribution. We have some vacant land out there. We can, you know, I got a dozen parkland sites, which I know will never be built for playgrounds, I've been suggesting for two years now to offer them up for surplus properties for, for to build a house on. Partner with the Habitat for Humanity or develop our own housing of, um, housing land bank, whatever the case may be. Let's move forward, but there has to be an agreement in place with the province to know what to what extent we're being drawn into this. The province has an obligation responsibility. This is something new we're taking on. Where are the resources going to come from? I hope there's going to be more federal and provincial funding than the municipal tax base, but I think there has to be a, a clear-cut line drawn in the sand of what our obligations and responsibility to this is going to be. I sent a copy of this report to my MLA, uh, Kent Smith, and I asked him to share it with all his caucus colleagues of all the HRM MLAs. This is important for their government to consider, and as well, I think we should probably send it to all our opposition members, MLAs, to know what we're asking for or perhaps what we're, we're striving for because uh, this is a, a unique time, it's a unique situation, and I want to make sure that we're not taken advantage of. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I s support the motion. Um, I'm a little concerned about uh, just how much work this actually is whether or not it's just a municipal provincial uh, MOU, <clears throat> excuse me, or if it's multilateral. And so when you think about the nonprofits that have to engage in making this work, um, I think that that gets to another level of complexity about how do you get all, all of the right nonprofits in the same room and are they signatories to this, you know, memorandum, <clears throat> excuse me. So I, you know, I do think that that's a significant challenge, and you know, we we've all talked about the phrase, you know, nothing about us without us, especially when we think about people who find themselves without a home for whatever reason, um, and how they participate and what this all looks like. So I think it's a big piece of work, but I also wonder how it's integrated into the homelessness strategy, and where will that fit? So I guess that's what will come back to us uh, when we see that this report, but. Um, I guess I just have an appreciation that this is a huge task 
to take on uh, to come back with. So thank you. Thank you. Councilor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, if you've ever lived homeless, you would know that that is a huge task to take on. And I think it, it, it is not about our jurisdiction. It is not about uh, uh, to what extent do we take this on. The fact is housing is a human right and it is our responsibility to ensure that we're doing everything that we can to address this issue and end homelessness in our municipality. And that means working with all the nonprofit organizations, which I have to say, Max has done an incredible job and, and Maggie as well, bringing together all of those organizations in that joint working group, uh, along with uh, staff from the province. You know, the province doesn't have the capacity, they don't have the policy framework. This is an opportunity for them to come to the table, be proactive, release release the centralized model which is not working and move towards a more proactive approach to address homelessness and housing insecurity uh, not just in HRM but this could be a model moving forward so I really appreciate uh, Scott thank you for the work that you did on this I thought the jurisdiction the jurisdictional scan was really helpful to see what other provinces and other cities are doing and uh, I look forward to receiving uh, the next report on this thank you thank you councillor ready for the question going question That motion carries, thank you. We have dealt with the next item, which is 1514, skilled talent recruitment. We've dealt with the Halifax Airport tax agreement. Uh, the first item from Audit and Finance, oh, the item from Audit and Finance passed on consent by Canoe Club will go to 1531 from the Grants Committee. Less than market uh, value lease, homes for independent living. Councillor Diggle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, move that the Halifax Regional Council approve and authorize the Chief Administrative Officer to negotiate and finalize a less than market value lease agreement with Homes for Independent Living Nova Scotia, located at 2505 Oxford Street, Halifax, as per the key terms and conditions set out in Table 1 of the staff report dated February 10th, 2023, and direct the Mayor and Municipal Clerk to execute the necessary agreements. Second. All right, thank you. Thank you. So Homes for Independent Living has been um, at this location for 40 years. The lease was up and so now the standard is to renegotiate a lease for 25 years. Um, it is the standard lease and um, yeah, the report was pretty forthright. Okay, ready for the question, colleagues? Carrie, thank you, Councillor Daigle Gammon and Grants Committee. Uh, 1541 <clears throat> stands in the name of the Deputy Mayor, Provincial Emergency Shelters. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'll put the motion on the floor. I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Mayor to write a letter to the Provincial Government asking that the province keep the shelter operating at 61 Dundas Street, Dartmouth open or provide alternative space and that the province adopt the same approach of maintaining capacity for the other emergency, sh emergency shelters that it is funding in HRM. Second from Councillor Kent, was it? Councillor De Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And so this is coming out of um, we've had uh, we've had an emergency shelter operating in the Christchurch Hall in downtown Dartmouth uh, for the last season, and the province has funded that. The provider has been 902 man up. Um, to my knowledge, um, you know there was some concern in the community about it, as there often is with these facilities. Uh, but it's been very quiet. Uh, there has not been any major issues that I'm aware of. No one's been writing me of problems. Um, and my my kids actually, uh, my youngest attends. Uh, uh, she her guide group meets in the in the basement. So there have been times where I've been waiting for her to come out, where I've had the chance to chat with some of the folks that have been sheltering there. Um, it does. It, there does not seem to be major issues here. It has been needed and it has been uh, effective. 
Um, unfortunately, uh, the province has indicated they wrote they, they wrote Christchurch indicating that they're terminating the lease with them, and so this shelter comes to the, comes to the end on May 31st. Um, and you know, in some ways, it's not surprising because it was always meant to be a temporary shelter. But you know, where we are, I think the old way of doing these things of we're going to stand up a shelter in the winter because in the winter, really, people really, really can't be outside is pretty outdated given how this crisis has just totally overwhelmed us. We're at a point where there's no space to be had. So why are we closing down spaces that exist out there? Um, the, it's hard not to take an unspoken message from this decision to be, well, we're fine with uh, you going to your summer accommodation, which would be Martins Park, Gary uh, Street, uh, Green Road Park, Sullivan's Pond, any of these cases, because that's what will inevitably end up happening to some folks if we just end up closing shelter spaces with no alternative plans or options. So uh, I think, you know, there, there's some clear, clear public policy, uh, you know, considerations to be had here that impact very directly on us. And I think we should be writing the provincial government to say, uh, if you don't have a plan yet, please do not close these spaces. We need them and people in our community need them. And it's not appropriate to be uh, closing seasonal spaces with the expectation that people will now go live in parks for the summer. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, it, it's interesting, though, we're running a letter. I mean, is that the right approach? Shouldn't the CAO be reaching out to our counterparts in the province and having a conversation? Shouldn't the mayor reach out to a minister and have a conversation, a phone conversation, and say, you know, what's up with the shelter? Uh, and can that not be solved in a very short period of time? Uh, you know, here we are with the letter. Maybe the letter is the uh, formal piece of it. But I'm hoping those conversations are, are happening uh, because, you know, if, as, the, as Deputy Mayor said, if you don't have a plan yet, well, let's keep this going until you have a plan. And that's the that's simple. So maybe I'm simplifying it all, and there is, uh, that's the frustrating part, I guess, about governments and governments dealing with governments. Let's pick up the phone, let's have some conversations peer to peer, and see if we can make a decision, find out where we are. Thank you. I'll, I'll support the motion, but I still think it should be a, a quicker way about than just a letter. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Yeah, there is those conversations that are happening. Certainly our folks who are in the uh, Working on the homeless are involved in that and the constant conversation with the province. Doesn't mean we have a specific answer yet, but there are some conversations. And so I agree with you on that. Uh, and as always, I'm quite happy to put my name on a letter. Uh, Councillor Lovelace. Okay, so I, I got to ask uh, because I, I don't know. I mean, we're finding out through the church that they've received a letter from the province. There doesn't seem to be a plan in place uh, to address the folks who are currently staying there. Uh, do we know of other emergency shelters uh, that will be closed? Is, is this the only one that we're aware of? Um, because if it's not, I think it should be expanded to a larger request to say that, you know, those uh, shelters that are being operated right now need to remain in place. Can, is there anyone that can answer my question? Um, I'm going to call Denise down to see if she has an answer on that. Denise Schofield, our Deputy CEO of Operations. Because I'm very nervous about the fact that if, uh, you know, other organizations are going to be receiving these letters from the province, we don't want to be sending multiple letters <laughs> to, uh, to the minister. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Denise Schofield, Deputy CAO of Operations. So, Councillor, we, we were informed by provincial staff of this particular one. The other shelter that they've recently opened is on North Park Street. There was a commitment there that that was going to be for a longer period of time. This one, as the deputy mayor indicated, they were only going to do it for the winter, but also, as indicated, the, the need is still there. Okay. So we have um, requested that the CAO, uh, the CAO has written a letter to the, to the deputy minister. We've requested a formal meeting to have further discussions on that and some of the other challenges that we're having with various locations. Uh -huh. So we're just hopeful to, that that will be happening in the next number of weeks. Okay, so I, I can support this. I, I guess I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little uh, concerned about w whether or not it's actually going to have any impact. Thank you. No see, offense, uh, Mr. Mayor. I see you doubt the power <laughs> of my signature. So, uh, <laughs> Councillor Cuddle. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I will uh, fully support uh, sending a letter, and I'm glad to hear that there are actions being taken through other channels to raise these issues and have these discussions. I mean, essentially, by terminating the lease, uh, we're giving the residents of that shelter an eviction notice. Well, we're not, but the, but the provincial government is. They're, they're essentially giving them an eviction notice and um, without providing any alternative place for them to go. Um, you know, we know that there are people who find themselves homeless will end up most likely in a number of our parks and in our public spaces. Um, we, you know, we can't go and evict people from public spaces without, without providing an, an alternative space or place to go. So, you know, I, I think that this is really quite questionable, um, particularly when there is demonstrated need for shelters and for housing right now. Um, it, it's definitely premature, and I hope the province does the right thing and uh, extends that lease and keeps people in. You know, it's not, it, it's not appropriate housing, but it is, it is better than being outside in the elements in, 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 in parks. So um, I, support, I support this motion. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, colleagues. So just a couple notes on some of the questions. Um, you know, uh, Denise already indicated there is the staff piece that's going on separately. Why I think, do I, th do I think a letter from the Mayor is suddenly going to change the world on this? Well, no. Um, but it's important for us to go on record um, as a body uh, indicating that what we do not um, except that this is the, an appropriate way to handle this issue anymore. Goodness knows what the all, everything we've been dealing with around homelessness in our public spaces over the last two years to, you know, there are folks in downtown Dartmouth um, who uh, don't want to go to a shelter in Halifax because Dartmouth is their home and it's their community. And to not have any shelter space available in Dartmouth given everything that's gone on just is, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. Maybe the province has uh, an alternative plan, right? Right? because this is coming to us via the notice that to the church along with some staff discussions um, you know maybe they have an alternative plan I would dearly love to hope that is the case unfortunately reality uh, over the last two years has often left me more disappointed than uh, overjoyed there has been some success but it's often also met with disappointment too at times so I think the the, the reason to write the letter is for us to be on record as to you know what we want in our community on this um, politically as the uh, uh, elected representatives of um, our community. Um, so the staff piece, uh, that's already there. And to Councillor Lovelace's point, right, you know, I, I did try and leave the motion open-ended. Uh, the last line about, uh, is that the province, and that we ask that the province adopt the same approach of maintaining capacity for the other emergency shelters that they're funding in HRM. So, you know, I had that in there because I was thinking about the North Park one and I was thinking about the one in Sackville because uh, the need is not just a downtown Dartmouth the need, the need is broader than that so uh, I was trying to keep it keep it broad and you know the other thing is you know I'm not wedded to this to this Christchurch space I think it has worked the provider it has worked with the provider but we're not privy to all the information so that's why I also have in the motion or alternatives right you know if the province has some other great plan wonderful right uh, I'm just very apprehensive that there is actually no plan at all thank you okay thank you uh, Deputy Mayor ready for the question colleagues That's carried. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, now, colleagues, we have a couple of added items. One of them's in camera, I think. The other one, I'm not sure if it's going to take a while, but we may do that after the public. We'll go, I think what we'll do is we're going to let staff come and do the uh, in camera when we come back. Um, so we're going to go in camera at 20 past 3. Um, and then we're, if we have time after the in camera, we can come back and deal with the issue of Councillor uh, Outhit. Uh, in the public, do notice there's a motion. If not, we'll do it after the public hearing tonight. Is everybody okay with that? So we're going to take a break. We're going to come back at 20 past 3. Just in the interest of, uh, I like people to, uh, if there's a new face around council, I like to introduce that person. So I want you to meet Councillor Hensby. Uh, folks, no, no, he's been here before. Elizabeth McDonald is in the clerk's uh, table today. Elizabeth, great to have you uh, with us and working with uh, Ian and the team. Thanks for, for being here today. Does somebody want to move me going camera? Councillor Lovely, seconded by Councillor Russell, all in. Uh, does somebody want to move the minutes? I wonder if the in camera moved, moved by Councillor Mason, seconded by Councillor Cleary, all in favor? 
Okay, the minutes are dealt with, and Councillor uh, who Lovelace, seconded by Councillor Russell. Uh, move we go in camera. All in favor? Aye. We'll be back in 20 minutes in camera, colleagues. Thank you, and we'll get the clock fixed in the meantime.
Counselor. All staff have what is here. Gotta be present. Okay, thank you, Boyd. Great conversation. Counselor Hensby, have you got something before we begin? Or? Yes, Mr. Mayor, just let you know after the public hearing, I'll be leaving the council meeting for the community meeting in Mineville tonight. Okay. I uh, sense approval for that. All right, we're going to begin with, we have one public hearing tonight. It's case 24063, interim incentive or bonus zoning program outside of the regional center. Um, so thanks to everybody for joining us. We have a full gallery, delighted to see it. The process is that we will start with a staff presentation and then if there's any questions of staff. After that, we'll go to the public hearing. Speakers can participate for a maximum of five minutes. I ask you to keep your comments respectful, on topic, and directed to the chair. The clerk, this fierce looking woman over here, who's got the signs tonight? Christy. We'll uh, announce when you have 30 seconds uh, remaining. Um, okay, clerk, have we got any more additional correspondence since this public hearing began? No further correspondence has been received. Thank you. All right, we'll begin with staff. Cassia Tote, are you doing the presentation? Uh, I ask you to come forward. You're familiar with us, nothing to be afraid of. Well, generally, uh, there's a few, but uh, we welcome you and we thank you for being here and the work you've been doing. Uh, okay, so Mr. Mayor to Council, my name is Kasia Tota, uh, Manager of Community uh, Planning uh, with Planning Development, and I'm pleased to be here today to present on Case 24063, Interim, interim Incentive Abundance Zoning Program outside of the Regional Centre. So in terms of background, uh, as many of you are aware, Incentive Abundance Zoning is a tool under the HRM Charter which allows the municipality to require public benefits that contribute to the public realm or livability of the area in exchange for increased, increased development permissions. Uh, and this also includes a mandatory requirement for affordable housing in the central plan area. Uh, the interim bonus zoning process uh, outside the regional center was initiated through the 2021 themes and directions report of the regional plan review, which is currently underway. And in November of 2021, the regional council adopted a public participation program for this process. So in terms of a uh, quick background on how we currently use uh, the incentive bundle zoning tool under the HM Charter, we currently have um, really three main approaches. So uh, in the downtown Halifax plan, and, uh, and, um, the process that was adopted in 2009 and still remains in place for the remaining area of downtown Halifax, there is a pre and post bonus heights uh, program with a fairly low uh, per square meter um, value, uh, which applies only for the post bonus heights in the downtown Halifax area. Uh, and this was reviewed um, as part of the center plan process. So we made some changes to how it's applied in the center plan. Uh, in center plan, there are, again, two different ways. So there is an, a, a 
approach for anything that's as of right because we have zoned significant areas of central plan. Uh, so there is a clear formula in policy in the land use bylaw which requires that any development over 2,000 square meters uh, contributes to the bond of zoning best based on the top 20% of the floor area of any of any new development uh, in in mi mixed use typically mixed use uh, zones such as the downtowns and centers and corridors. Uh, there is a diff different way of calculating bond of zoning for center plant future growth nodes such as Penhorn Mall, uh, Southdale, uh, Strawberry Hill, Dartmouth Cove. And this method is based on individual appraisal. So here, 12% of appraised bare land value uh, at the development agreement stage is subject to bundle zoning. Uh, and this is intended to recognize that those larger sites are more complex. They have to invest in infrastructure, roads, and parks. So this appraisal process is intended to um, uh, consider all of those uh, additional complexities. Uh, and, and we also don't know that the change in the future land use is, is less known, so we couldn't really put a value on it in the land use bylaw. So why interim bond zoning? So we believe that council uh, asked us to advance this work ahead of regional plan review to test the approach in suburban and rural areas before suburban, suburban or rural plans uh, are fully developed. So we looked initially at both suburban and rural areas as part of this work. Um, uh, we also focused typically um, mostly on plan amendment applications, which often result in a significantly increased development rights on land. Uh, we want to tie new development rights to public benefits and to increase the livability of an area or to contribute to affordable housing projects uh, for nonprofit housing for the broader region. And also to provide access to the Bono Zoni Reserve grants outside the regional center. Right now, under the administrative order, uh, we can only fund projects within the central plan area. So if we start collecting funds from outside the area, we can also fund projects. In terms of the community engagement uh, for this process, uh, this was mostly done through the regional plan review, plan review where we heard uh, loud and clear from the public and stakeholders that we need more tools to fund affordable housing projects in particular, but also to fund other public benefits tied to development at a time of uh, rapid growth in a municipality. Um, as part of the PPP for this project, we also had a project website for a number of months, and we also conducted stakeholder engagement. And some of the key feedback, uh, there were also past reports uh, and themes and, director, themes and directions posted. There was actually a whole issue paper on this topic as part of the regional plan review. So in general, we did hear uh, support for connecting growth to more affordable housing and, and public benefits through bono zoning. Uh, the stakeholders, particularly those on the affordable housing, of course, in the affordable housing sector, so a benefit to expanding the grants to more areas and to um, have more resources to fund um, new nonprofit projects uh, and to use more tools to support affordable housing. Uh, of course, from the development side, we did hear concerns about uh, any you know, additional impacts on costs of development and you know, the predictability of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the program and trying to make it, making it as streamlined as possible. So the approach that's in front of, the proposed approach in front of council today includes, um, uh, includes changes to regional plan policies and local land use bylaws. And it is intended to apply only to regional or community um, municipal planning strategy amendments in the urban service area for new multi-unit residential, commercial, or mixed-use develop, mixed developments. Uh, or where there is increasing permitted density. So we're limiting it to only plan amendments. We're not uh, trying to impact existing rights in advance of doing comprehensive review through the suburban plan. So we are focusing on the urban service area and plan amendments. This will also include future service communities identified in the regional plan, such as the remaining lands of Morris Russell Lake, uh, Sandy Lake, Highway 102, uh, Blue Mountain, Bridge Cove Lakes, and, and similar areas. So it does apply to service boundary extensions, potential ones. Uh, 
So the, the policy, proposed policies is in the regional plan, but we also, to, to make sure that the program is um, uh, easily implementable, uh, we also include amendments to 11 of the land use bylaws in the kind of suburban rural, some of them touch some of the rural areas, but any bylaw that has, you know, a portion of the service boundary in their, in their area, uh, that's what's included in the package. Those are the LUP amendments. In terms of the public benefits that's, um, uh, that are uh, proposed under the, the amendments, they are the same public benefits that are uh, currently in the central plan. So we model the approach very much uh, on a central plan approach um, with, a, with a couple minor changes. So affordable housing, so there's mandatory contribution to affordable housing, 60% of the public benefit must go to housing. There's also options to, for heritage protection, for community and cultural uses, for Miso Park improvements or land acquisition, and for public art. Uh, so uh, again, most of the public benefits we provide as money and you for affordable housing, and on-site provisions can also happen through the Bonazonia Agreement, but are limited to, uh, to heritage protection and public art. Uh, and the funds will flow through the, to the Bonazoni Reserve, which is already established under a program and can fund uh, for affordable housing projects um, for nonprofit uh, housing providers. In terms of a quick uh, calculation of the two approaches that are embedded in the amendments, so it's very much based on central plan approach where individual sites. Um, where we actually, I should probably backtrack. So part, as part of the, the process to make the administration flow easier, we did commission Turner, Turner Drake uh, in the fall of 2022 to do a broad land value assessment uh, for all of the bylaw areas outside the regional center. Uh, and this is based on recent uh, land sales and with the assumption that uh, the highest best use will be based on multi-unit residential or commercial uses. So that was uh, submitted, uh, and they are a certified um, independent appraiser. Um, based on that, we included in each land use bylaw amendment a value uh, for each land use bylaw area. Uh, so for sites smaller than 10 hectares, the formula is the same as central plan. So 20% of the floor area over 2,000 square meters. And for larger sites, we propose the appraisal method similar to future growth notes. Uh, in addition, the land use bylaw amendments provide an exemption for developments by nonprofit or charitable organizations that have a mandate to provide affordable housing, and where the development includes a minimum of 60% of housing. So this is an exemption that they would not apply to those developments. I want to say a few words about the rural areas, because uh, I know uh, we had some questions at the first reading about why rural areas are not included, and we know there's lots of change happening in those areas as well. Uh, so uh, given that this is an interim approach, we also looked at the report provides information about um, the types of plan amendment applications that we get and their nature. And what we noticed is that uh, there is really somewhat limited uh, densification opportunities in areas without central water and sewer. So you wouldn't see so many large multi-residential developments where it's kind of definition of the tool is density bonusing, but it's about density. Uh, we also see pretty rare examples of multi-unit residential developments in the rural areas outside of the service area. There are also significant environmental constraints which make that uh, really challenging. Uh, most of the plan amendment applications are relatively minor in nature and housekeeping, so we wouldn't want to trigger bonus on provisions for minor housekeeping amendments. Uh, and of course, we can explore this further as part of the phase five of regional plan review or, or the rural plan, but at this time we felt that it was perhaps a little premature given the time we had to study the, the area. Um, and as part of it, uh, however, as part of the, there's a recommendation to also, should council approve these amendments, we will have to up update the two administrative orders related to bonus zoning and affordable grants. And we propose that um, regardless, the grants could apply, could be apply across the region. So uh, even groups in rural areas could apply for grants from the bonus zoning reserve. 
uh, to make it accessible to various areas. So I want to speak quickly about the results of bonus zoning. We get lots of questions. So what's happening to all the money? How much have you collected? Um, and of course, uh, we are in a period of fairly high growth. So since the bonus zoning funds really um, got initiated in 2020 or so, so after the package A approval in the fall of 2019, so it's been uh, really two and a half, two and a half years or so, no less than three. <laughs> So at the time of writing the report, we had $4.3 million in the bonus on your reserve. Uh, however, the current amount is 5.6 million, so this is as of this week. Um, and we also withdrew um, just under $500,000 uh, for grants already last year mm -hmm. for grants. So we would have collected close to uh, $6 million up to now. Um, and. Uh, so the funds are linked to the affordable housing grant program that uh, you know Jill, who's in the audience, is administering. And within the regional center, because the program was very new last year, we in that year we funded two projects from the fund. However, this year the, uh, we just had a deadline. I think the application just closed recently, and we have about nine. We have nine proposals uh, right now in the regional center uh, for this year. So I think that's a, that's a quite a big improvement. It kind of signifies that. There's definitely more, more, more going on in housing. So proposed amendments. Uh, so in the package, the policy, uh, the amendments are proposed in the regional plan. So policies G16A to G16G <laughs> to enable the bonus on your framework for future plan amendments. And also those that have not been considered uh, by council yet, so they could be initiated, but as of time of first notice, if they have not come to council yet, so this will take, if approved, it will take effect immediately for any amendments being considered by council um, following the public hearing. Uh, there is also a pretty extensive package uh, for land use bylaw amendments, so 11 bios, bios amendments, uh, which specifies it's very similar language to central plan land use bylaw, which specifies price definitions uh, and rates and um, what should be included in um, bonus zoning agreements, the powers of development officers, so it's all clearly spelled out. Um, uh, and there's also a schedule. So the way the administration works, this may be too much detail, but there is a schedule attached to those amendments which allow us to track future applications. So anything that will come to council in the future um, will be tracked in this schedule. So we would know which, which lands will be subject to uh, the bonus zoning in the future. So it is a little different than the center plan, but this is the only way we can track applications which are actually linked to plan amendments. So the types of applications that will be uh, subject to this will be regional and community plan amendments. Uh, we would, uh, if approved, we would return to a council with amendments to the two administrative orders, which govern the reserve and uh, affordable housing program. And of course, there's an exemption for nonprofit and charitable organization develop housing as part of the package. Uh, so here's the recommendation, and uh, this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kasia. A uh, question of clarification, uh, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Kasia. Um, so I have a question around slide six and I guess slide nine. I'll just frame it up first. So in particular, um, the lands that are, would be in the catchment related to the Eastern Passage Cow Bay area there's areas of, that entire area is not serviced, um, would be outside of a service boundary. There's parts of that that would be captured within Cow Bay that would also be rural. By some definitions, other times it's not. Again, the quandary that happens in District 3 in Cow Bay. But, so I'm not sure how this would all be applied there. Um, what would be the trigger that would set these pretend this should this go forward for those lands to be um, eligible for this bonus zoning? 
Sure. So through uh, through the mayor to Council Kent. So uh, so the, on this map, so the grey area indicates the extent of the service boundary. Mm -hmm. uh, so this comes from our from our database. So there is a small area in grey that in district in the area area number two, um, five. Sorry, five. <laughs> Yeah, so the gray area actually has some services. So those lands, anything in this area, if they came for a plan amendment application, then they would be eligible or be subject to those, the bundle zoning. Only the area that is in gray. serviced? Yeah, in gray, yeah, yes. Yeah, I'm not so sure you're right on that, but I guess I'll challenge that another time, but I'd, I'd be interested to see where you go with that because anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there um, and again, if it's serviced, it's very, very minimal. Mm -hmm. And if the boundary changes and it includes parts of Cow Bay, mm -hmm. although traditionally would be considered unserviced because it's serviced, that's the thing that will, is that the piece that would trigger this and then it would suddenly be yeah, yes, eligible? That would, that, would think, that would require a change to the regional plan. So if regional plan, allows consideration of extension of services yeah. and they would come under that. Yeah, so, so yeah, okay, because I guess when I, when I think about it, I don't know how much time I have left, Mr. Mayor, but when I think about it, there's an, it, it doesn't apply to rural, but that particular area has a little bit of both. Um, so I just want to make sure we aren't creating an unintended barrier in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much for this presentation. Just a quick clarification on slide nine, uh, where uh, you made the statement, uh, rare multi-unit residential development applications in the rural areas. And I'm just wondering if you could kind of underscore rare, because in Voyager Lakes, while it is unserviced, we have massive apartment buildings. Um, and as the province approves these very large septic systems and water systems outside the service area, and I'm seeing an increase in those, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you could clarify what you mean by rare and what is the threshold uh, at the point where we actually begin to acknowledge that there are uh, significant applications coming forward for multi-unit residential developments. Upper Hammonds Plains is another great example of that. Hmm. Do I have this mic? Oh, I have mic, okay. Yes. Uh, thank you for this question, Council yeah. Lovelace, through the Mr. Mayor. Um, this, this, what, this is an interim approach, and the majority of the plan amendments are within you know, the service area that we can support. And I think many of them, even the, in the suburban area, we're trying to direct towards the suburban plan and the rural plan. So we can definitely explore through phase five or through the rural plan to see how to treat us. But it's... Um, so so yeah. there isn't really a definition for rare then? Well, we looked at the numbers of plan amendment applications in the rural area. So based on the information that we were okay. able to collect, there were... Yeah. Uh, I think just, you know, a handful in the last couple of years, so. Um. Okay, well, I'm seeing a heck of a lot in Upper Hammonds Plains is what I'm saying. So the majority of the new development there is multi-unit residential development. So, um, you know, they're not single dwellings. And so I, I just feel like, you know, while I understand that this is interim, we're, we're giving up on the opportunity to address the fact that these communities too uh, need affordable housing and could benefit uh, from the public ben benefit. I see Kate has stepped up. Yeah, Kate Green, did you want to speak? Uh, through the m mayor to the councillor, just to add additional clarification, uh, there is um, a table in the report, table two, that identifies the number of plan amendments by mm -hmm. subregion, so you can see rural as well. Uh, the applications you're referring to, I believe they're already enabled in policy, so they be development agreements, gotcha. so they, they don't fall so under this. they wouldn't this. fall anyway. No. Oh, thank you very much, Kate. I appreciate you're that. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Diggle again. Darn. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you for the presentation. My question is also around rural. I don't know, Kate, you might want to come back, but I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> Just around the rural, and we're talking like this is interim, and it's in the service, service with water and sewer, but we have some that are only service with water, not sewer, and they are designated under, um, they're called growth, growth nodes, like the future growth nodes. So where would they fit within this? I mean, we're looking at the Fall River Road right now with almost 500 units. 
going to be built under the site plan approval. It has water. They're going to be doing a, um, and I, I, environmental constraints kind of jumped out at me, but uh, you know, because they're doing a uh, on-site uh, septic system that's going to pump treated effluent into the lake, but they, they have water, but not the sewer and it is multi-unit because it was a designated growth node. And I think that there are two or three other that are out in that area in district one. So where would they, how would they be allocated or how, how are they, how would I see them in this report? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, through Mr. Mayor to the councillor. Uh, so we did focus for this interim pro uh, program for the ur full urban service that includes water and, and sewer. Uh, and it's also again for plan amendment applications. I'm not sure whether this one would be subject to plan amendment or again existing uh, development agreement or yeah, policy. No. So that could be that could be the difference. So um, yeah, we can again revisit uh, more more broadly. But we we found that there were not that many at this time in that they are in this situation that could do larger developments for on private systems. So when when you said that they could track future ones, would they be tracked, would, would they, the ones that would might be in these future growth nodes, mm -hmm. are they, would they be tracked? Oh, do you mean the future service communities, like the special right. planning areas? Oh yeah, they, they will be subject to this policy, yes. So if they need an extension to, that would be typically a link to plan amendment that they would be included. So Sandy Lake, Morris Lake, all of those ones as well. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Thank you much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think a rare example would be the Seven Lakes and Porters Lake, uh, the Bearland condominium where we have centralized water, centralized sewer for that particular development in Porters Lake, which is not on any municipal central services, but it's on their own private condominium service. Um, I'm kind of concerned about this serviceable boundary matter only, because if it's just serviceable boundary for water and sewer, there's very limited rural areas. In my particular area, North Preston would be the only one that would qualify. And North Preston has been part of the urban zone anyway for, for, for ever since amalgamation. Um, Cherry Brook Lake Loon and East Preston who are part of that same municipal planning strategy. They all have water uh, available to Lake Loon and Cherry Brook. There's no water in East Preston, but they're hoping to someday. So I'm kind of curious about this serviceable boundary limitation. Uh, the urban reserve zone that's currently in the West Fall area we have water all around it. There's a proposal there uh, in regards to the Kuma properties, but also the Cal Developments are looking at doing a development as well. They may be making an application to the province for a special planning uh, request. And we also have the special planning uh, area from Muscadabra Harbor that's been provincial consent to already. And they're planning on doing that with the centralized sewer, centralized water service. So would the Muscadabra Harbor vi uh, uh, Garden Village concept be considered under this program? As the states now, you don't even have the Eastern Shore West Planning Municipality in this, but would it qualify under the special exemptions or special rare case examples? I'd just like to know where would they fit in this particular area? They're, they're trying to build one, you know, with whatever, whatever you present in this document is exactly what Muscat Albert Harbor is trying to do with their planning zone. But according to the rules here, it ain't gonna happen. But how can they make it happen? Uh, through the mayor to the councillors, so uh, we focused this program on the service boundary, uh, the urban service boundary as we call it, so we're not, we're looking at that mapped area, to be clear. Um, as far as the rural areas go, there are growth areas in in rural areas, and we've talked about that here at council before, how we need to do more work on defining this big word we call rural. We need to do more work defining what that means and uh, understanding what it is to be on the edge and of the service boundary. What type of communities are those versus something like Sheet Harbor versus something like Muscadabit Harbor. Those are all different. Uh, so we are certainly set up to do that work um, in preparation for the rural 
plan. And there is a motion on the floor that we have to address from community planning and economic development pointing us to do that. And uh, we'll have a rural planner starting um, with us in the next few months who will be working on that specifically. So that's coming, that work on defining what we mean by rural, which we've heard a lot. Uh, in terms of the special plan area, the, the um, piece of property in Muscadabit, the density bonusing program would not apply to that site. Uh, you know, that is, um, we need to do more work on servicing in rural areas and understanding the costs and the ways we can provide better infrastructure to rural areas. Um, it's very expensive to do sort of smaller systems, so we have to look at that more broadly, and that work is anticipated in advance of the rural plan. Um, and that special plan area is sort of being considered um, independently from that work we have to do because it's been pulled out by the province. But that particular one in Muscadabra Harbor is going to be probably a Bearland condominium concept where centralized water, centralized sewer within their own development mm -hmm. maintained and by themselves, not by the municipality. So we don't have to supply the water. We don't have to supply the sewer infrastructure. They provide it. So mm -hmm. why could they not apply? Councilor, we're getting a little bit outside okay. the <clears throat> specific area. I'd like to know why they would not be eligible for the bonus density. Uh, Councilor Cuttle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Kasia, for this great report here. Um, so I, I see there's two sides to this. There's the collection of the density bonus, and there's the expenditure of it. So I'm just wondering if you could clarify, um, in this interim density bonus um, initiative here, what can the density bonus funds be used for? Can they be used for capital and operations when it comes to affordable housing, or and also, where can they be spent? Th uh, through the mayor to Council Cuddle. So uh, just, to, just to, again, maybe go back to Council Hensby's point as well. So uh, just because density bonus doesn't apply, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that uh, the minister through the special planning area or council cannot consider and approve a plan amendment. It's just there would not be subject to the density bonusing requirements, which in most cases is, uh, you know, paying money in lieu for affordable housing. So it can still be considered, uh, but it's just not subject to this. Uh, on the other hand, we are recommending, if council supports this, that rural areas could still qualify for grants under the bonus zoning reserve, so they can still apply and potentially be funded for projects, but not contribute at this time until we uh, consider this further through other processes. And what can the grant be used for? So uh, for the affordable housing, which is the majority of the funding, it can fund uh, nonprofit or charitable groups developing affordable housing projects sub, you know, with, in agreement with other levels of government. They can often leverage other kind of funding. And it's mostly for capital uh, expenditures, but it can support um, some of the preliminary work uh, doing building assessments, for example, buying land for housing, um, uh, developing you know some of the designs uh, for uh, for housing as well. Jill here can speak more to that, but that's it's mostly capital, but can also work some of the, some of the preliminary development work for projects as well. And it can also be repairs and maintenance of buildings, so not just new construction. Okay, so so that's what I want. So. So when I think capital, I think like construction of homes. When I think operating, I think about like the day-to-day -day operations. So the maintenance, the plumbing, electrical repairs, painting. Would all of those types of expenditures be? I could because I hear that's one of the biggest challenges with the yes. with affordable housing providers is the revenue stream. So I'm just. Can I just make I mean, sure just, the money let me just confirm with Jill. Uh, I believe some repairs can be. Oh, here we go. They can. They can. Yes, the rehabilitation or renovation of existing units can also apply. Can, uh, can also be qualified. Okay, excellent. And um, I got a couple of minutes left here. I just wanna, my other question of clarification was around what do we see as the lifespan of the interim bonus zoning? I, I, you know, it's in, what does that? What does that mean? I mean, we don't know how long the suburban plan and rural plans are going to take. I mean, that, you know, if we go by center plan, that could be decades. But um, <laughs> let's not hope. Let's hope it's faster than that. But I just think, how long is interim? And um, and also, 
as, as part of this, we have to update two administrative orders. So I'm just really curious, too, about the timeline for like, if this gets approved, how long will it take to get it into effect? And is that difficult to reverse or change if we want to make amendments to this down the road? Uh, thank you for this excellent questions. Uh, so it is it is intended to be interim. So until I would say until the you know uh, portions of the suburban plan are approved, and we'll have another report coming to council laying out the work plan, and and seeing how. Um, whether we'll be doing the entire suburban plan at once or providing some options for, you know, more areas to intensify, for example, around the BRT corridors that was a request by council. So I wouldn't, I would say, you know, uh, that we're allowed to talk about timelines, we are still working it, but I would say, you know, two to three years perhaps until we come up with something like, like a package A. <laughs> Correct me if I'm uh, speaking after tr after term, but I wouldn't say it's going to be too uh, too long. But it will be enough time for us to study the approach and what's working, what's not. Can we improve on it? So I think it's a really good test case, focusing on plan amendments first before we apply more broadly. Uh, and in terms of approval, so should council approve it? Uh, of course, it has to go to the Minister of Municipal Affairs for their their sign off at which time uh, we can start working on the administrative orders. And uh, under central plan, I think it didn't take us very long, a couple of months to return with the, to have the program up and running. And right now we would just be making tweaks to existing AOs. I would look at Jill here, but I think that you wouldn't, I don't anticipate it being too long at all. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, we're on clarification, uh, Councillor Purdy. Mayor. Um, I think these are clarifications. So, so just so I understand, the the bonus zone, uh, the the bonus zoning um, dens density bonus. Oh my gosh, the density bonusing is applicable to developments within the service boundary, but any affordable development project can apply for the funding stream in HRM no matter where they are in HRM. Did I hear that correctly? Or did I understand that correctly? Okay. And I'll just do my, I think there's three of them. Secondly, for, for developments that are it, on the books right now, at what stage does this get, get applied to current developments? Or is this like once it's pass today, then all developments from this point on are now um, subject to this new policy. So, so wondering about current developments. And th the last one is when you were doing the um, stakeholder engagement for this report, um, I may have missed it in the report, but I saw some of the stakeholders that, that were engaged with, were developers in the city engaged as well as stakeholders for this particular report? Uh, thank you for those questions. Throw the Mr. Mayor to the councillor. Uh, so, so, so yes, if council approves our recommendation, any, any non-profit housing developments could apply for the grant program anywhere in the region. Um, in terms of the stages of development, again, this would apply for any plan amendments applications that are either currently in process or that um, would be initiated by council uh, in the future. So not all developments, but only plan amendment applications uh, and also special planning areas by the province. So we've been talking to applicants for the past year or so since it was initiated to kind of talking, you know, uh, speaking about the, the potential for the interim bonus zoning program they may apply to plan amendments. So we try to make uh, applicants you know, aware of it uh, in advance. Uh, and when would it come in effect? It would come in effect fully uh, once the minister signs off on it and we publish the notice of approval in the, in the paper. So that typically takes a couple of weeks to a month. Okay. And whether developers were in included. So we did present to the development liaison group uh, so presenting the you know the framework for the for the study, uh, also the Halifax Partnerships Affordable Housing Group, which also has some developers, and we also reached out to UD to UDI. Unfortunately, it, that that didn't uh, quite uh, come to fruition, but we did make them aware, and I think we shared some of the 
uh, through a slideshow some of the some of the proposed approach, uh, you know, last spring and summer. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Morse. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Cassie, for their work. Uh, huge project here to get this to us at this point. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the CPI uh, tool that's there, why we need an escalator, and why um, why you wouldn't use uh, financial appraisal instead when land values are going up faster than CPI. Thank you. Great. Thank you for this question. Uh, so when we did um, uh, the density balancing study for Centre Plan and also for this project, the land appraisal uh, by Turner Drake, we actually in the certify appraisal they use you know all the um, um, uh, uh, accepted uh, industry standards. We did ask them about you know how frequently should we update the values and. Um, uh, and what in the, in, DC, in the index we should use. And it was based on their advice that CPI is well, well advanced. It is a little more stable. It's not as volatile, perhaps, as land values. And Statistics, Statistics Canada actually has a whole full methodology on their website that's posted, it's available. And we actually incorporated in the land use bylaw, both in the center plan and in these proposed amendments to tell exactly our staff how to update the CPI values. So it may not be perfect, and will, uh, but it's based on you know accepted methods. It was recommended by the appraisers both times, uh, and we feel it's it's appropriate. Uh, and again, around appraising each and every site, this was against something that we study as part of central plan, and it's, it is a balance. Um, Vancouver, you know, uh, I think every site has to be maybe appraised and they're looking at performance, they're looking to a great level of detail for each development. Uh, we don't typically, um, you know, ask for those kinds of development details. Um, so it was, a, it, was, it was a balance of gaining some public benefits and having a program that's fairly easy to administer since we're quite new to it. Uh, and also not, not um, putting too much, I guess, cost on development. So trying to balance all those things. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a just a quick question uh, regarding the evaluation uh, methodology. Um, when we consider the average land value stated in the local uh, land use bylaw, so for Hammonds Plains, um, Upper Sackville, Beaver Bank, or Beaver Bank, Hammonds Plains, forgive me, please, Councillor. <laughs> <laughs> that big long one. Um, I'm, I'm trying to understand where the generalized future land use zoning actually comes into that because that would change uh, the, the value of that property. Uh, so while we may have that corridor as an MU or C4, that generalized um, uh, generalized future uh, zoning would have an impact on that. So I'm, I'm trying to understand where we are with regards to understanding the actual value of that property under the site-specific multi-unit um, 10 hectares or less. Like, are we just looking at the zoning today? Are we incorporating the generalized uh, future land use and the potential for that? H how do we calculate that? So this was part of the, thank you for this question, Councillor. And uh, so this was in the Turner Drake report as well. Um, uh, and they, they did look at current zoning, the sites, the pick, picked sites that would have been, they assume high is the best use. So they looked at sites that may have potentially been purchased for multi-unit or commercial developments. And they applied those values as, 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 the, pot as the potential value in each of the land use bylaw areas. So it was localized, but they looked at as many recent sales as possible. And they, there is a whole methodology they have that I probably am not <laughs> equipped to fully explain, but that's, that's included in the, in the report. So they did assume some up zoning, but again, it probably wouldn't match exactly of the highest and best use. But well, well because, it, because at one point they're building as a right, and another point they're going through a development agreement. However, there's no sewer system, but yet in the map, they're in the service area. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just really confused uh, because it seems like we're sending different messages 
here where they're highlighted as being the service area, but there's no piped water there. Certainly at some point, somebody might bring piped water in mm -hmm. or a new um, uh, sewage water treatment plant, but you know, so I guess what I'm saying is I'm, I'm, I'm confused by the valuation method and the certainty of that land value. So, so through the mayor to council, I believe there's a small area that is serviced in this land use bylaw. This is why they're uh, included. So yeah, it will be based on that and some recent values. Uh, so again, that was average and we didn't pick. So the consultant provided three values, like the low value, the most likely average value and high value. And then we also discounted it by 60% to eliminate any potential for error. Okay. So we feel like we've, we're within a realm of, it's not uh, perfect or exact, but it's again, the balance of doing site specific appraisals for everything and having a program that's somewhat, you know, not too onerous on staff and developers to administer. And it's also, we don't want to create, you know, uh, shock the development process too much. We want to start, I guess, somewhat conservatively at the start. That's why we discounted the values uh, okay. uh, at this time. Yeah, I just, I, com I, I disagree with the map um, mm -hmm. because I, Hammond's Plains at, at Pock Walk, I, I would not call that a serviced community. So anyway, that's, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Those thank are my points. Thank you, Councilor Cuttle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna follow up there on Councilor Lovely. It's around this whole, the rezoning. So we're doing the suburban plan. This is about the order of operations and how, and how we're going to um, account for the, the lift that comes with the zoning. Like we know that there's certain areas, like particularly when I look at the map in the gray, I'll, use Heron Cove Road, for example. We're looking at uh, transit there. We're looking at corridor zoning there. We know there's gonna be a, 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 a lift. If we rezone, if we upzone, there's gonna be a natural lift in the real estate. And I'm wondering how are we capturing that value to put it towards affordable housing? Like, I feel like we're losing out. And I don't understand why we would be discounting. Are we gonna, is that 60, 60% coefficient, that discount going to go on in perpetuity? Are we going to phase it out? Are we, when we get past the interim phase, are we going to look at 100%? Like, I'm, I don't quite understand why we would do that, um, particularly when I, the values that are in the report, they seem very low to me. Um, and then the other question is about, um, why would we not ask for performers or, or conduct appraisals for each property? And is the, like, what is, do we know what the financial implication of that is? Like, are we leaving money on the table? Because so when I look at the calculations in the report of what we're getting for each development, it seems, it does seem quite low. Uh, so through the mayor to the councillors, again, very uh, excellent questions. Uh, we, the, the, the discounting was actually recommended first, even in the central plan bundle zoning study, because it was a, a new program, a, 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 a new framework for applying bundle zoning. And we, we didn't do it one by one because we knew we were abazoning most properties in central plan area uh, as a wholesale. And a similar thing will likely happen through the suburban plan. Uh, so right now we're focusing plan, plan amendments. And again, it is a balance of how much do you want to charge versus looking at the current you know, rising costs of development and the need for housing um, and also the administrative burden. So doing one by one right now, we are focusing appraisals on future growth notes and even ten, that can take several months, you know, four to five months to even get an appraisal. They're so busy. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's, it's actually takes, it would, you know, delay uh, the whole development process. And for the larger sites, it is, um, not, you know, it does, it does take 15 to $30,000, depending on the comp complexity of the, of, the, of the site to actually pay for the appraisal. So I guess we looked at the, the pros and cons of making an interim approach work without hopefully too much pain on the whole development industry, uh, which as we know, we need, we need housing and the costs are rising. So it, it is about proposing something that would create some, some new funds, but, but what is the actual 
uh, detailed. I think Jill, through inclusionary zoning, will be doing a more detailed analysis of all the various market impacts and uh, taking that step further. So I think we have definitely have lots more, more work. Uh, and we can look at you know doing a whole study as part of the suburban plan to actually uh, look at what's working, what's not working. Uh, can we increase the, in, increase the, the values or the formulas in a different way? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, colleagues, <clears throat> that's a lot of clarification. Um, I'm going to open the public hearing. I'm going to open the public hearing. Uh, move to the speakers list. We have uh, on the speakers list we have uh, Andrew Bone and Corey Smith. No, we don't have Corey Smith. He's just here. Corey, Andrew Bone is the one name we have, and then anybody else that wishes to uh, come forward will have the opportunity to do so. Andrew, how you doing? Good evening, Mayor Savage and Regional Council. Uh, I'm Andrew Bone, Director of Planning and Development at uh, Clayton Developments, and my colleague beside me is Kevin Neat, Vice President of Planning and Development at Clayton Developments. Clayton Developments Limited understands the direction council, th that Council is taking with respect to density bonusing and appreciates the efforts of the municipality regarding the provision of affordable housing in our communities. We are here to express our concerns with the proposal and how it will be implemented, not with the, the, you know, the fact that there is a, a density bonus charge. Our comments tonight supplement our written submission. Um, ultimately, the way the uh, implementation of this bonus charge is being proposed has issues. Um, we haven't been able to come forward to date uh, prior to this with concerns to staff because we are literally learning this program in real time. We have experience with our Penhorn site and as early as, or as late as this afternoon, I was having discussions on how to fix the density bonus charge for that site. There are issues and we feel those issues will be exacerbated by uh, moving the charge to larger sites. We, we know we have a problem on a small 24 acre site of, of Penhorn and it will only be exacerbated on a 600 or 700 acre um, development like Sandy Lake. And ultimately what we are seeing is that the rights and privileges granted to us in a development agreement are being frustrated by the density bonus charge. It's the density bonus charge is making it difficult for us to achieve the negotiated rights without uh, going back and doing an appraisal, which we only had done a few months ago because the charge isn't flexible enough. So we're really concerned about the implementation. And if this charge is approved tonight, there has to be, or we would request, um, continued work uh, on getting the density bonus charge right for these master plan and future growth node areas, and that there be continued dialogue, and that uh, fixes to the issues are prompt, um, as it was indicated that the interim density bonus charge may not be so interim. They have long-term effects and can be very costly. And these costs uh, don't benefit uh, affordable housing, they don't benefit the municipality, and they don't benefit the developer. Um, so there, there needs to be a lot of work on how we implement these policies. Further, we request that the municipality work with other levels of government so that their affordability and attainability programs work well with the proposed charges. Uh, our understanding to date is that they don't work well and everybody's going on in their own direction. And we, we'd like some consistency there so that all programs work and there's an understanding by all levels of government. Ideally, 
Uh, further industry uh, consultation is required to fully understand the details. Uh, the, as, as I said earlier, the experience with this is recent and new, and we know there are issues, and if, if this density bonus charge is implemented tonight, we will be back to see you uh, in short order, I imagine, um, because it's uh, uh, an untenable situation the, the push and pull of the, the density bonus program on our development, on the development agreements that are negotiated. So we're, we're asking for that uh, continued cooperation, that continued commitment to, to get it right, work together with industry. And uh, I'd like to thank your attention to this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I can assure you that everybody received the letter, the correspondence that you sent, and uh, I think everybody's probably gone through it. Uh, before you go, a uh, couple of questions here. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mayor. Andrew, you're always welcome to come back here and talk to us again. Welcome, welcome back. I know it's a novelty for you to be here. Um, so, uh, you know, Councillor Smith and I were just talking about when you say it's impacting your, your rights on a development agreement, could you unpack that a little bit? I think I understand what you're saying because of a conversation I had earlier today with, with the gentleman sitting to your right, but so, so the issue is that usually a development agreement that's multi-faced allows you to move the density around the site in negotiation with the city, but that there is some hesitancy to do that because of the complexity about assessing the value for this purpose? Uh, basically, yes, but w w what happens is that um, when we have a development agreement for a, you know, a future growth node or a, uh, you know, a large development area like it's Sandy Lake, um, the, the provisions are generally flexible because it's impossible to fully predict yeah. the future. And so we have ability to move uh, units or from site to site or building to building and the way the density charges has been structured, uh, it hasn't uh, been easy for us to actually activate those rights um, without, yeah. without either amending the agreement or going back and doing another appraisal, which is extremely costly. So I mean, certainly, I think council knows that in short and long term development agreements, multi-phase development agreements, we often, as the market changes, are asked to change the development agreement, move stuff around. And so that, I'm concerned about that. Thank you for bringing that here. And uh, could you unpack the rebate uh, or the work, the working well together piece? So we're, you, the federal, provincial, and municipal governments, this is shocking. You're saying we're not well aligned on this affordable housing piece? <laughs> like this is really, you know, if, if either one of you could just unpack that a little bit more, because I, I think understanding how we could work better together is important. I, I'm going to flip that over to Kevin Ead, our Vice President. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of Council. Um, just to unpack that a little bit, we're, we're working, as you can appreciate, with, with three levels of government on, on affordable housing, municipal and provincial, and of course, through, through CMHC. So we have, we have these various levers, and what we're seeing is, is everyone has the same goal. Perfect. So now we have to talk about how we can coordinate together to maximize impact. And that's what's not happening. We're not able to maximize that impact. We've got CMHC financing programs that, that we uh, can take advantage of. We are working with the provincial government on, on, on grants uh, to enable some affordable housing. And then there's, there's the missile side, the bonus uh, charge that we're discussing this evening. We just think there'd be maximum impact for affordable housing if the three levels of government, or at least the two levels of government, work together in an in a, in a, in effort to, to maximize that outcome. Okay. Thank Makes you. Sense? Thank you both. Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I think um, Wei just kind of asked, what, I wanted more clarification on what you meant by the frustrating of the development agreement um, that, that this density bonusing would have. But in, in the correspondence that you sent, it, is that the unintended consequence that you you wrote about with the development permit application um, you, that that is at risk because it could trigger the payment of a bonus charge. Um, the bonus uh, uses a way to establish land rights in, in the development. So 
the the issue with uh, with the development charge and the rights. So the rights enable something, um, but the density bonus charge does not necessarily respond to that. So for example, you might have a site that uh, originally was thought to have 60 units on it, and it now has 100. And another site has uh, 40 less. Well, that other site with 40 less might have to pay for the full original complement on that site. So a builder buys a building and uh, buys 40 units, but originally there was 100 on there, that other 60 went over there, and that developer on that, on that block of land might have to pay more. The, the, the developer with the, or the builder with the, the building that now has more units, it was only originally assessed for 60 units, now it's 100, he's only paying, or he or she is only maybe paying for 60. So <laughs> it's very complicated and it's, um, there's a lot of potential unintended consequences. These charges, uh, in the end, get billed back to the customer. Right, so it's either the renter or the purchaser, um, and it's not equitable if somebody's one one, per, one site is overpaying and one site is underpaying. It's it's not a, a situation. It, it'll frustrate the land sales. It'll make it difficult for us to actually uh, get a builder in to develop a site. Um, it's it's so. Then in reading the, the report and, and you responding to it, what would you suggest then, knowing that we need to, to help promote affordable housing in our municipality, what, what changes would you suggest for the density bonusing? I, I don't have all the answers because our experience is new, but I know that through discussion with the municipality, we can get a charge that's implementable and that works and doesn't have these issues. These issues are making it difficult on certain sites to develop. And, um, you know, like I said, this is, this is a real-time experience from this afternoon. It's brand new. We, we uh, have really just become experts in this ourselves because we are li living it with one of our sites. Uh, it's not a, it's not been a common thing because we, certainly for our company, we don't develop in the center plan, so we did most, most of the time. So we, did, we only have this limited experience with Penhorn and, and now a little bit with Mount Hope. So we, we, we know it can be corrected. Uh, we know that there's work that can be done to make it work for everybody. You know, we're not disputing this charge. We're, we're disputing how it's implemented. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kevin, did you uh, have something? Yeah, thank you so much. I just want to follow up on, on that point just a little bit more. Um, we'll get this sorted out for Penhorn with staff. Staff are fantastic. We'll get past that. No, no concern there. My concern is, is if, if the appraisal somehow fixes land use, we won't be able to respond to market. And that's what gets me tense and gets our company tense of these master plans, four or 500 acres, that's the magic in them is to be able to re <clears throat> respond to market. And my concern is that if an appraisal locks that down, that, that's a problem. Um, and so we have to find a way so that the appraisal, A, we don't have to keep doing appraisal every, every year, or B, doesn't quite lock it down. It might lock down the high level value, like check, the, that, that makes some sense. But on a site by site basis, we have to find that tools to be able to, to make sure that, that the benefit um, is is there up front and day one is and is, is predictable for for the developer and for staff and for council and the public so that's what we're talking about more about the implementation how do we really work with it and as Andrew uh, said we don't have all the answers and uh, we're looking forward to be able to work with staff to try and develop that way of, of uh, bringing it forward in, in a manner that makes makes most sense thank you very much thank you uh, Councillor Kent Thank you, Council Porter. You asked the question, but it, and so this is, gives me another opportunity. Um, can you repeat the piece that you spoke to around us collaborating with the province in relation to alignment? And if you have something else to add that would suggest that the province might be open to 
collaborating with us on alignment on this kind of subject. <laughs> I set you up, I think. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for the question, Councillor. I just want to say, I, I think some of these questions we can ask of our staff as well once we get into debate as opposed That's to just fine. the speakers. And I'll ask answer. that too. Yeah. No, I have no insights, Okay. Uh, certainly. Um, and I, I just think it's, it's, it's an ob as an observation of, of a company that is, is trying to put the right foot forward and introduce a, a project that, that has a significant amount of affordable housing in it. Um, not just a few units in one building. We're, we're trying to put a, a real dent in it. Um, and this is the first project. And we're looking for, to, we're looking to maximize as a developer would be in terms of maximize the, in this case, the public benefit in this, the affordability in it. And we're just seeing, we're seeing um, some opportunities that if we, if we collectively got in a room, got together with the municipality, the province and the private developers, you know, what ideas could we come up with to work together to have to to maximize those synergies? So it no is, particular tools in, in in mind specifically. It's just how do we all work together? That's all. And and that is relevant specifically to this particular change, or in general. This is this is relevant to our topic this evening because the density bonusing charge that's that's on here that, that we're speaking to tonight would be applied to, to lands um, of say, say any future master plan community. So if we already have this um, charge in place, then how is that gonna work when we're looking at other yeah. options for affordable okay. housing? And I don't have the answer to that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. So I, I appreciate very much the, <clears throat> the openness. I just wanna advise council, this is, we're a little bit, way beyond where we normally are when speakers come forward and we have maybe a question or two of clarification. We have two learned speakers and uh, we're getting a little bit deep, so just clarification and then we'll get into the debate. Uh, Councillor Outhead. It was clarification. Um, so I'll try and I'll try and do that, Mayor. So thank you for being here. It's, it's good to see you. And I, I'm just, I am looking for clarification, I guess, on your objective this evening. Um, so you're not opposed to this in spirit and in, in, in overall, and, and that's great. Uh, I've heard you have concerns about density shifting, about appraisal costs, uh, about trying to uh, predictability, about issues that you're experiencing presently, and you're worried about the issues, I guess, increasing as this is ex uh, expanded to a master planning area. But you're also saying that you're pretty sure you can work with staff on this to come up with something to, that's, that's good. So what exactly are you asking us to do tonight? Are you saying don't pass this? Are you saying pass this, but give staff a lecture on how to work with you? Are you saying, I, I'm just wondering what, what you're looking for us to do here. Well, I wouldn't be so forward to, <laughs> to provide advice to regional council on what they should do. Um, however, you know, we've identified that there are issues that need to be resolved. How they're resolved, um, you know, that's, that's between staff and, and, and council, I guess. Um, you know, it's, it's your prerogative to do, to pass it or right. defer it or, or, or whatever, or request clarification. Okay, yeah. All right. That's spoken so, very well as a former HRM. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how did you like being on the other side? Um, okay, so I guess I'll bring this up. I, I was just looking for a little bit. It's just not clear to me. You have concerns, but you think the concerns can be worked on. You're not opposed to this in spirit, but I, I just wasn't quite sure of the objective of the evening of you being here. Ultimately, we don't, ultimately we don't think as drafted okay. the charge will work in the... Uh, in the master plan master area. Plan. Okay, super, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, folks. Um, all right, there's nobody else on the list, uh, but if anybody else wishes to speak, I see a hand. Looks like a familiar face in the back of the room, but I'll confirm that when uh, you come up here and give us your name. Good evening, uh, your worship, members of regional council. Uh, my name is Stephen Adams, and I am the executive director of the Urban Development Institute of uh, Nova Scotia. <clears throat> this is a very short presentation, um, and just in, in following up with what um, with what uh, uh, Kevin and uh, uh, Andrew—that's right—I knew that. Uh, 
uh, had just said about, you know, maybe a uh, possibility of deferring this or getting additional information. Uh, UDI has a very successful, albeit brief, uh, history in working with HRM uh, to offer perspective and positive feedback regarding some of the initiatives, the posse system, Red Book Amendments, Center Plan, and also the Trusted Partnership Program, whereby uh, UDI and its members worked with HRM staff and came up with some reasonable solutions. Uh, to that end, I would offer or extend an offer um, to HRM staff the opportunity to meet with uh, members of our uh, of our group, of which uh, Clayton uh, are more than welcome to come because they have first-hand information with this. Um, if you defer this, we could offer perhaps a month or so. It would take us uh, not too long to get something together. Uh, we come up with some uh, solution to help get the kinks out. We're not opposed to this. We just like to make it uh, hit the ground running with a with a process that works well. And who better to tell us than Andrew and, and Kevin with their first-hand experience? Um, I do have just one last question, if I could. The uh, the input from the partnership and DLG and, and UDI is a member, I'm the member of the DLG. I'd like to know what that input was and, and what input was incorporated into this uh, particular bylaw. So that's my, uh, my presentation and, and uh, I'm open to questions, but we are here to help and I'll end off every time I uh, speak to council that we're, we're here to work with HR and become a trusted partner. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Is there anybody else here who wishes to come forward and speak to this tonight? Is there anybody else who wishes, not you, Boyd. Is there anybody else who wishes to, well, you could actually. Is there anybody else who wishes to come forward? Is there anybody else who wishes to speak to this? All right, if not, we will move the closing of the uh, public hearing. Council, what is your wish? Councillor Morris. I'd like to put the motion on the floor, if I could, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council, one, adopt the proposed amendments to the Regional Municipal Planning Strategy and applicable land use bylaws as set out in attachment A and B of the staff report dated February 10th, 2023. Two, direct Chief Admi the Chief Administrative Officer to a draft amendments to Administrative Order 2020-007 ADM the Incentive or Bonus Zoning Public Benefits Administrative Order and Administrative Order 2020-008 ADM, Grants for Affordable Housing Administrative Order to update the permitted use of money in lieu funds as outlined in the discussion section of the staff report dated February 10, 2023, to all areas of the, of the municipality. And B, return to council for consideration of these amendments upon provincial approval of the amendments set out in attachments A and B of the staff report dated February 10th, 2023. Second. So moved. Thank you. Second by, I saw Councillor Stoddard's hand, uh, Councillor Morris. So just, just to remind everybody um, where this came from, because it's been a while, um, my concern with this was that we were seeing a huge uh, growth, a housing uh, construction boom, but just outside the regional centre, we weren't able to capture any of that construction and, um, and have funds set aside in our affordable housing reserve. So this is just intended to build on the successful program we already have in the regional centre and apply it to the growth that we're seeing in suburban areas. Um, I don't think that um, what we have is perfect. Um, it's an interim program. Um, I think it um, does need a few changes and I have some suggestions, but I wanna hear council discussion first. I have some amendments, but I, I think one, some of the reasons we might wanna consider um, revising it is that uh, the original program that we're looking at is from 2015 and a lot has changed since 2015. That was the year before we saw a huge upturn in growth. Our growth started to double, um, our population growth doubled and we are now in a housing crisis and I think we need to um, make the most of density bonusing and to, to get as much as we possibly can to provide for our nonprofits who are doing affordable housing. So um, I think we should pass this tonight, but I would like to um, hear your comments and I have some suggestions for amendments for um, how this might look in the fall when it comes back through the regional plan process. So thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Councillor Clary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so just in general, I, I like where this is going. You know, I was very concerned when we brought in the density bonus program in the regional center and we weren't putting anything out in the suburban rural areas because it really did unbalance the fees that developers had to take on. And, you know, it was clearly much cheaper to do greenfield development, you know, bulldoze a forest, put up uh, tract housing than it was to do environmentally, financially sustainable development in the urban core. And so this is helping with that balance that and also raise money, desperately needed money for affordable housing that we can give out. But I do have a couple of questions. So, and especially dealing with uh, some of the comments that were brought up by our, uh, our development community. As I understand how, and from reading the report here, but how we do the density bonus in the, 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 ch the charge that it, when it becomes payable is when the DP or the development permit is granted. So in order to get your development permit, you've got to pay the fee, then you get your permit and you're ready to go. Am I correct in that? Uh, through the Mayor to Councillor, yes, but because of recent charter amendments which allow uh, us to uh, defer the payment, uh, we've actually been, been issuing long-term, uh, letter, accepting letters of credit to okay. postpone the so payment. So they can so get the yeah. permit before they make the payment, but they will make the payment at some point. Yes, so sometimes it's DP only, for example, so when they come for occupancy permit, so right. this has been, we've at least issued one or, or right. several of them, so. But the reason that's important is when you come to get the development permit, that you're, you're taking some tangible plans to the planning and development saying, here's what we're planning on doing on this site. So they have a concept of what it is gonna be there, number of units, the density, all that kind of stuff, correct? correct. Okay, so I'm confused by this whole phasing then. Uh, my understanding is when you have a master plan community, let's say you have five or 10 phases. Each phase, you would get a development permit for that phase specifically. You're not gonna get a development permit for phase 10 when you're doing phase one, correct? Correct. Okay, so when you're doing phase one, you know what's gonna be in phase one, and you're gonna pay under this new system the, develop, the bonus for what's gonna be in that phase. So. The I, comment that was raised about this is causing uncertainty, we don't know in a mass plan we can move density around, but when you come in to get your development permit for that phase, you know what's gonna be in that phase. Well, if I could just clarify very quickly. So I, I think the, the question is about the appraisal, so the appraisal value and how and how that's done. So you could, um, and I think Penhurst was the first site to go through and there was already a baked policy in the center plan, uh, you know, with the approval of, of package A. Uh, so it was all fairly standard. We didn't know of all the issues that may arise. Uh, so I can understand that there may be some, some, some perhaps, you know, issues right now. With Southdale, which I was involved with the quite, you know, intimately, I think we learned from the experience. So we actually, at the policy level, we provided from flex and flexibility and in development agreement. So there is more flexibility now um, because we were creating a new policy, as we will be with plan amendments, so we can actually put some additional language in each of the sites to look at any of the nuances of the site. To provide that flexibility. So you could do appraisal for the whole site, or you could do appraisal for the your phase one, uh, and then come back for another one. So if it's a really long-term process, I don't think it makes sense to do it for the whole site. Right. Uh, again, you can help with certainty, but if you want the flexibility, then you could do it in a phased approach and we even provided for accepting land for housing and other options, so that can happen. Anyway, going too far, but. So from what you've already learned, you've baked that into this interim proposal. So we are, you, you can do that now. You don't have to worry about, well, there's uncertainty in the future. What you're doing now, you could get the permit for that. You could pay the fee just for those. It, yes, so the, the proposed amendments basically set the framework for requiring bond zoning for plan amendment applications and a general approach. But because each one will be policy amendment and most likely with a development agreement, this provides for, because we write a new policy, this can provide for additional flexibility that can be considered during the planning process. So to wrap it up then, you already have now provided in this new interim proposal, the flexibility that they're looking for that can be accommodated in what you're doing. Exactly, there is provisions in the land use ballot and the policy that you know, we can provide for, the development agreement can provide for options of when and how to pay the bond zoning. Okay. And this includes how much of the site you consider as part of the appraisal. Right, okay. Thank you very much for that. Councillor Othit. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And 
I do support the expansion of the, of the density, bon density uh, bonusing plan, although I was initially, I, I still prefer inclusionaries only. That's, and I've had that debate as long as I've been here. I prefer it. I don't like us handing out the money. I like, I like us uh, letting the people who know how to build, manage, and develop uh, have affordable units and affordable neighborhoods for folks. But lost that battle, and here we are. But now that we have it, in part of the uh, municipality, it's only fair that we have it. Uh, the other parts of the municipality, as Councillor Morse has indicated. Um, so. A couple of questions. First of all, I mean, all of this is contingent too. I hope it will, will a, a lens will be put on this density. If a density, if a request comes in for density bonusing, we, we're going to have to look at the, the the reasonableness of it. Is the infrastructure there to acquire, you know? If there's no school, no public transit, the roads already uh, above capacity for traffic, you know, are, are we going to have some assurance that we're going to use those lenses as, as well on them? The second thing, now we've heard the, the concerns of, of um, Clayton and UDI, and they're under the impression that this is this is new to us and new to them. That's fine, uh, and they have concerns about implementation. Do you feel that there's any? It, it, you know, and maybe we should defer it a month while you go off and, and chat with them. I, I'd like your response to that request. Uh, you know, is, is there, um, to me, I think some of these, you've mentioned uh, just now some, some workarounds. I see some similarity with the CCCs here uh, on, on how this works, but I'm just a little confused. You know, are you, are you talking with each other and do you think any more discussion time is needed before this is implemented or are you? pretty much there. So how's that? I'm setting you up for an opinion, but it's what I want. Through the uh, mayor to the councillor, uh, absolutely um, there will be opportunities to work as uh, Mr. Bone noted, you know, this issue came up this afternoon. Right. Uh, I'll be chatting with Aaron McIntyre first thing tomorrow morning um, because she's handling that to discuss what we learned today. In terms of um, if there are significant challenges that we can't overcome, we have the regional plan coming forward in June. And I think we could bring forward amendments to any bylaw or the structure of the policy if we do find there are things that we can't resolve. As noted, Penhorn is the first. Uh, so we're working through the administration of that. I still believe that can be solved within the administration of that, but if we do have to change the policy to provide greater flexibility, we can do that in a couple of months when the regional plan uh, starts its path. Okay, thank you. And the uh, the the lens of uh, reasonableness of infrastructure and transportation and, and whatnot, that will be a lens or a, or a determining factor for this? Because I can see people coming in to apply for this in areas that may not be suited. Uh, through the mayor to the councillor, that's a part of every plan amendment application. Yeah. And now under the policy in the regional plan, we have to assess all the priority plans uh, as well as our standard infrastructure requirements mm -hmm. uh, that's baked into all our policies. So that's a part of every application. Yeah. <laughs> I know, it, but it's, it's sometimes hard for us to, uh, as council to implement. And all we're right. working on infrastructure charges. <laughs> uh, yes, and, and, that's, and that's a good thing. All right, thank you. That's great, Kate. And Cassie, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Just, just on the note, though, we asked for inclusionary zoning. The province has granted right. us the right to do it. We've asked for a report. It yep. is going to come back sometime in the next few right. months, I believe, right? Uh, we've had inclusionary zoning specifically. Yeah. yeah. Through the mayor, uh, to the mayor. It's coming. Uh, it's passing through uh, into senior review, so it should be here uh, in the next month or so. That's good. Thank you very much. Councillor Lovelace. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, okay, I, I've, I've got to dig down into a couple of things, and thank you for this report. Um, y you know, my, my questions earlier about how, uh, like, wh where does it apply? Um, when I look at the map that was in, in your presentation, and I'm looking at, at uh, Hemis Plains, Beaverbank, Upper Sackville, I can see clearly where Lucasville Road is, and I can see clearly where Hammonds Plains Road is. And yet at the same time, I'm not very clear on where this would even apply, uh, considering we've got Schedule J, which the report acknowledges. Um, and so we do have a report coming on Schedule J and, and looking at, at that, but that's in the future. 
but I, but I'm unclear where this would actually apply uh, within that land use, particularly because on the map for um, in in the presentation and it is map one. I don't see Beaver Bank there. I don't see Beaver Bank Road, but I see Hammonds Plains Road, which doesn't have water. So uh, it doesn't have uh, uh, sewage. Um, but yet there's a funny little blurb, almost like a community that seems to be serviced, but there's no community. I, I'm, I'm really confused, Kate, by this map. Through the uh, chair to the councillor, you are right to be confused. We took a look at it as we stepped away. Thank you. Good eye. Uh, that map is not actually tied to the amendments. The amendments reference the urban service boundary. So that map does include some areas with just water service. So you are not, uh, you are correct. And our apologies for that error in the mapping. Okay, be okay. yeah, because Beaver Bank is not there and they d that does yeah. have water. We will and sidewalks. Yeah, so and sewer. <laughs> oh. <laughs> to to be but clear, our, our, it's applying to the urban service boundary, which is water and sewer. Right. Yeah. So it doesn't apply to to uh, Hammonds Plains. Hence my confusion with mentioning of Hammonds Plains, but it is the land use that I'm so our, fortunate to share with my our colleague apologies. over here. District 14. Okay, so um, that being said, uh, I think the um, uh, case here where you suggested the flexibility in the development agreement moving forward, um, clearly uh, we're learning, right? As, as we move ahead and we uh, apply this. Um, so, I, you know, I do feel that um, I, I, I'm not clear on the unintended consequences or of negative impacts, should there be any, because I've, I'm, I'm still quite unsure of how we would be able to, what policy piece is giving us the opportunity to make that flexibility, other than, I guess, sitting down and looking at it site-specific and, and DA-specific and, and recognizing, okay, we need wiggle room here. Um, you know, is, is that how it's operating so far? Through the uh, mayor to the councillor, uh, as for the South Deal future growth no process, to which I was involved in, so I think we had definitely had lots of conversations uh, about it. And for example, there is policy to, for example, provide the option to developers should they choose to do so to provide land uh, for affordable housing or if they have, um, you know, agreements. Um, we also have appraisal that can be by, you know, we did for the whole site. But the payment can be based on you know each phase, and those phases are quite discrete and quite small. So, uh, and we also provided a formula which we agreed on per unit calculation. So should so there's a flexibility in development agreement. There's no maximum okay. cap, so should there be more units. So there is like a uh, per unit charge in the uh, uh, provision in the development agreement that can okay. be distributed across. So if there is changes from one area to another. Uh, so it may not answer all the questions, but there is some flexibility, we, so we did learn from it. Okay, and then the, the next report, I think you said, was in September, right? So over the summer, we'll have a better understanding of the application of this, the um, impacts, positive or negative, um, and certainly the, I think the fact that this applies to any nonprofit uh, building affordable housing in the municipality. I think it's really important um, that those nonprofit organizations are aware of that and certainly being able to communicate that, um, you know, to those groups. For example, in St. Margaret's Bay, who, who said to me, well, what about us? Right? Why don't we have this? Um, you know, and I, so again, you know, it's thinking about ways that we can acknowledge the density that is being built, um, potentially as of right, not through a DA. Right, which which is kind of the problem. There's there's that gap there. Um, anyway, I I, uh, I appreciate your work on this, and, and thank you for clarifying that map because we are really confused about that. <laughs> We're not going nuts. <laughs> We're not going nuts, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> well, the, <clears throat> the bunkers there. It's just not on the map. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Councillor Cuttle. Right. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, so I mean, I mean, this is great. I mean, we, we do, you know, as as been said, as has been said this evening, you know, we need we need housing, and I appreciate the concern about not wanting to make it too much of a burden that might impede the, you know, incentive to for development. I don't think we're there right now. I think there's more than enough incentive for development. So I I do have concern that 
we're not being, um, we are being too low in our in our asks, and um, you know, because what we need more, you know, as much as housing is, is we also need affordable housing, and the funding that we're getting for affordable housing, it really is a drop in the bucket, right? When even when you look at the five million dollars, that doesn't get us very far in building and developing and maintaining units. So, you know, I am interested in hearing, like, you know, what are the options that we have now? for increasing what we can get through this density bonusing program in this, in this interim phase. Um, I also think that, you know, to kind of build on what one of our speakers was saying tonight, one of our guests here, about needing a comprehensive approach, we really have to get the not-for-profits who are the housing service delivery um, agents in the room too, right? Because I have some concern that if you give land for affordable housing, um, it has to be affordable housing, but what we're hearing from the housing folks is that they need a blend. They need to be able to have market housing, to help generate revenue, to subsidize their deep discounted affordable housing, and we need to rethink this model all around. And I know part of that will be about inclusionary zoning. Um, but even as we're having this discussion now about perhaps um, a developer can provide land for developing affordable housing, you know, what is the thought around that in terms of making it work for the, for the housing providers? Um, you know, I think that's, those are the conversations that we need to be need to be having now and perhaps you're already working on it because often you already are way ahead of us um, when it comes to these discussions. Um, but um, yeah, like in particular, when we, when we look at, you know, the, whether it's the appraisals, whether it's coefficient, the 60%, um, whether it's, um, you know, looking for like the approach to the the approach to the appraisals, I, I'm just wondering, like you know, are there is there room here to take this a little further than than what's on the table? And what are your thoughts about that? Again, like through the count through the mayor to the councillor. So to answer the first part of your question, the housing system is complex one act will not result in a solution. So it's multiple acts and understanding how those acts relate. So we do have to be mindful with every action that we take, which is why we are trying to be balanced in this and not skew it one way or the other. Um, so we are quite mindful of the many and varied pieces of the system and listen to all the actors. Uh, we meet regularly with NGOs, uh, Jill's, uh, work in this is astounding. She's done an incredible job and she's frequently in contact with the province, with the federal government, with non-governmental organizations. And we are talking constantly about what we can do and how we can improve the situation and what are the right levers to pull. Uh, so I can assure you that those conversations are active and ongoing. Uh, we do need to revisit the grant program itself to make sure it's serving everyone properly. We're also looking at new forward thinking ideas like community land trusts, where we will see if there are ways of intervening at the community level in the market to establish greater stability um, and sort of counteract those market conditions which are very unpredictable. So, you know, there are a lot of actions that we are taking with respect to uh, the rate itself, I'll let Kasia speak to that, only I will say that, you know, we had a professional give us sort of the um, valuation, the values that we're applying, and, uh, you know, we picked the more moderate approach. They gave us low, medium, and high, and we went with the average value, uh, you know, trying to be uh, as understanding affordable housing is a, a desire of council, and also understanding that there's a lot of pressure on the housing system right now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, strong support for this, long time coming, great to see it here. Um, you know, most of what I've heard today are issues around implementation, which I respect and are actually really important, right? You know, you can have all the great plans in the world, all the aspirational goals, but you've got to actually turn it into a real thing. But I think we can do that, I, I'm quite confident. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, more about the, uh, uh, amendment from uh, Councillor Morse. 
Um, uh, there were concerns raised by some councillors about the revision. Uh, can we wait? Uh, well, and, and one of the speakers, can we wait a year or two or even three? And you know, the thing is, we have the regional plan piece coming in a couple of months, but also we can initiate, and Kathy and staff, the CAO, can initiate at any point if we see a real problem emerging or if the development uh, industry comes to us and says, this isn't working and here's why. So, you know, there, there's, it's not like we're going into a lobster trap and we can't get out for three years. We can, we can change it if we want to. Uh, I will also say, you know, I'm excited for inclusionary zoning, but I, I, I will put up a word of caution. This is to Councillor Outhit, because you, you were here, like the two times we've had uh, the equivalent of inclusionary zoning were the Mariana Margareta and then the Willow Tree. And both times the developers, when they actually looked at the cost of anything that we would accept other than one or two units, when we were like, well, we really want 20, or we really don't want them to be just 5 or 10% off market, both said, so how much cash do you want instead? And they didn't want to build units, right? So I think we, you know, like we, we want that to be, and certainly the minister said that when he's at the Bar of Council, like, you know, it's not easy. It's not as easy as people think it is. And I think we have a lot of work to do there. And I think it very much parallels what we're doing with the density bonusing. We've got to find ways to align our plans with, as was said, the uh, provincial government and the federal plans. Right now, you can have something that, you know, GMF's funding for green sustainable housing and CMHC's giving it lower interest loans and the province is giving you a grant and we aren't, we, we make you apply separately, we may not fund you. Maybe we need to align better than that. I think, I, you know, when we first started talking about this 10 years ago, we talked about having basically if the province is doing it and it's in Halifax, we'll match it or we'll come in with whatever we have. We won't match it because we don't have that kind of money. So I think that we need to be looked, now that we have the ability, which we've only had for a year uh, or a year and a bit, to, uh, f to participate in private sector affordable housing, couldn't do it, weren't legally allowed to do it before, but you know the Houston government has brought that to us now. I think we need to have a really good look at that and I'm excited to do that. But I, I think we should go ahead with this today, pending potential review, uh, rev uh, revision or supplementary report or whatever's coming from uh, Councillor Morse. And, and the real focus is to work with staff and with the development industry on implementation once we have the policy in place. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. <clears throat> Just a comment, Councillor Mason. I recall on some of those circumstances you mentioned, we also were stymied by the fact that we simply couldn't define affordable housing in a way that satisfied the provincial and the municipal. Yeah. They have, yeah. That's exactly right. Um, so we ended up with parking, I think. Um, uh, Councillor Purdy. And thank you, Kate. Um, that's reassuring to know that as this is being implemented in the next couple of months, if you're experiencing, you know, some very difficult uh, things, you can bring them back to be amended uh, when you bring the regional plan back. So that's, that's good to know because obviously there very well could be un unforeseen um, dif difficulties. Um, I'm wondering, from your perspective as staff, with your experience, do you foresee any unintended consequences of this? Do you think that one of the un unintended consequences could be a stalling of developers to build needed units when there's already a lot uh, kind of going against them in any way? Uh, and I'm curious about this inclusionary zoning, and I way kind of touched on it there. Maybe this is jumping the gun, but I'm looking forward to the report. I was going to ask, would, would developers have a choice? Like if, if they didn't want to do the inclusionary zoning piece, could they do the, the bonus zoning option instead? But that, that may not be able to be answered tonight. So um, yeah, I'm just curious about that. Uh, through the mayor to the councillor. So I think we are uh, intentionally being fairly fairly conservative uh, with the approach uh, because it is it is new. It is uh, not affecting current development rights, but only plan amendments and of these large uh, future service communities, which rep can represent thousands of units. Um, we also the appraisal process intentionally looks at. Uh, the additional costs of development, so infrastructure roads, they're kind of being deducted from it. Uh, so it's 12%, 12 which, you know, uh, depending on the site, it can represent, you know, several thousand units, but if we feel that this is a, you know, still a fairly modest additional cost, given how much we are uh, upzoning some of those sites. Um, and speaking to, um, as you know, this proposal is tied to some plan amendments on uh, Main Street, which will be coming for public hearing a few weeks from now. Uh, and again, um, 
no, no concerns. They reviewed the report. They know there will be some of the first amendments to go through this process. And, um, you know, no, no concerns from them uh, as well. So uh, we definitely appreciate the kind of worth of caution and the need to monitor and learn from the process. But, but we feel that this is a fairly, you know, reasonable, reasonable approach. Yeah. Thank you. Just a question for me before I go back to Councillor Morris. Um, uh, count, uh, former Councillor Adams had mentioned the, the discussion with the DLG and when that had uh, taken place. But I wonder on a broader level, the, the, the new Provincial Government Housing Act, when they bought in the task force, they also bought in the Housing Act that said we can't, you know, we can't con consult, liaise, have public hearings. Has that impacted uh, this process from your point of view at all in terms of the ability to talk to the public about it? Uh, to, to the mayor, um, no, I, 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 I don't, I don't believe so. Uh, the, the, because it was meant to be a fairly quick turnaround for this process, the public participation program the council approved was, you know, fairly limited to stakeholder and and online presence. And of course, we did uh, have a whole um, paper on this regional plan review. So we did hear from the public through the survey and and of overall comments. So we feel we did, we did, we did consult uh, with the public and as well as stakeholders. So it didn't affect us the way that to say Penhorn and uh, Mount Hope uh, was, we were not allowed to uh, discuss further publicly, public, mm -hmm. get public participation from, but not in this process. You don't feel that's an issue. It is because it's broader. It doesn't just affect the special planning areas, but uh, our, our understanding is that they are to follow council's policy for these areas. So we're setting new policy, which will uh, impact it. Um. That's fine. Thank you. Councilor Morris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, colleagues, for the discussion. Uh, I, I tend to agree with Councillor Cuddle that I, I don't think we're raising enough money for affordable housing, and I'm, I'm looking for ways that we could raise more. Uh, we certainly know that the need is huge out there, um, and I, I think there are ways to, uh, to generate some more money. So um, I'll put this amendment on the floor then, if I could. I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to provide a staff report that considers and provides advice on the following changes to the interim bonus zoning program as part of the regional plan review and, and adoption. One, consider revising the 60% public benefits for affordable housing to 100% of payable benefit for at least five years. Two, consider suburban sites of more than 100 housing units to be independently appraised using the same method for sites of 10 hectares or larger. And three, um, have a recommendation for a market review of density bonus square foot amounts every five to 10 years with CPI adjustments in between market reviews. Thank you, Councilor Mason. Second by Councilor Mason. Yes, I think the This is for a staff report? Yes, this, this is, um, this is an interim density bonusing program that we're reviewing tonight, or that we're voting on tonight. And so where are we going next? And this is what I would like to suggest that um, to, we know that we're gonna be discussing the regional plan in the fall, and that these amendments could come forward during the regional plan to generate more funding um, for affordable housing through that process. Th through the mayor to the councillor, apologies. Uh, we're wondering if it would be possible to direct that to the regional plan review, only because it will just create efficiencies. If you do oh. want an individual a report, we will do that, but it will create efficiencies if we can bring that work forward as part of the regional plan review. Okay, I'm sorry. Sorry, yes. thank no. you. So that's considered a friendly amendment? Uh, I, I consider that very friendly. Put forward by Kate Green, seconded by, <laughs> accepted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Cuddle, it's a friendly amendment. It's a friendly amendment. Uh, th thank you. Councillor Morris, anything else? Uh, no, I just... I just, I just want to make it clear. Um, I find the process a little bit um, complicated here, as I'm sure others do as well. I, I think we should move forward with the original motion, and then what I'm talking about is um, to to strengthen it um, in the fall as we come forward with the regional plan process. 
So this is the, the reason um, I was hoping we could do this tonight is that I actually have developments, pending developments right now in my district, fairly large ones, that will not generate anything for affordable housing that are displacing people. Um, low, you know, people in low rent apartments are being displaced by these um, developments. And so my concern is to try to get something for affordable housing through these developments now and to get something a little stronger in place in the fall when the regional plan comes forward. So that's, that's where I'm headed with this, and I, I, um, I hope you can support it. Thank you. Okay, but this, is, this will come back with the regional plan, is that what you're saying? In the fall. So this motion would go ahead tonight, but the report would come back in the fall. Well, whenever the regional plan Mayor, uh, to council, uh, the, f the report has three motions, uh, three recommendations, which we can move ahead with tonight. Councillor Morse is adding a motion, a number, number four, and that, w that work that's listed in that motion will be directed to the regional plan review. So you would move ahead with the amendment package and then direct additional work on the values to come forward in the regional plan. Is that clear? Yeah, we have an opportunity to vote or vote against it when it comes back though as part of the regional plan. Yes. Depending on what staff tell us the impact is. Yes. And there would be some discussion with communities, Thanks. developers, deal, okay. Councilor Mason. We defer it for a year too. <laughs> so we could defer Thank it for you. <laughs> We'll all just settle down a little bit. No, oh, the hair's pretty bad at this point of the night. Been here a long time. Don't have a new, I actually have five minutes, but I won't take even three. So uh, I think this is great. I want to thank Council Morris for that. Uh, you know, to break it down, when, when I, I talked to her about it earlier, and the, you know, what, one of the questions right now is given the public, the, the affordable housing crisis that we have right now, uh, can we take more of the density bonusing? Do we want to say to people, you can put a nice piece of public art in your lobby of your new building, or should all that money be going to affordable housing right now? So, you know, staff is being asked in the first part there to explore what does it look like if we continue not changing the amount, but just redirecting it to say, these are the things that matter right now. And then the second part actually was something that, uh, you know, I, I'd flagged as well is is any future growth node or or major DA in the uh, plan for in the center plan is uh, uh, now uh, would be the appraised market value uh, rather than uh, just what's proposed right now and what we're going to hopefully approve tonight, which I support, is anything over 10 hectares. So you know, not to put them on the spot because they're still in the audience, but like Penhorn, w if it was outside of the regional center, wouldn't qualify for a an appraised density bonusing uh, in the rest of the suburban area because it would be under 10 hectares. And so I think that we need to come up with a, a model so that when we're talking about large sites that are strip malls being converted into housing, but that are smaller than a greenfield site of 10 hectares, that, that we can capture the appraised value. Uh, and then the final piece there is, there was some concern about CPI adjustments every year forever, right, forever. And we know if we'd done that if on the original density bonusing 10 years ago, it would, would not have kept pace with the market value of that housing right now. CPI is not going up the same. So I think that uh, this is worth getting uh, review back, and that's why I was saying, you know, during the regional plan review, we can talk about changing these things because I knew this was coming. And so uh, I'd ask for council support in this. Uh, it is for a staff report. We're not making a decision to do any of those things right now, but I think these are some good ideas that merit further discussion, despite the fact that I hate giving Kate anything else to do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, this is excellent. So, um, you know, I think the timing on this is just, it's perfect. This is great timing. Um, you know, with the work that we're doing with the regional plan, um, the need for affordable housing. I, my, my question here is on uh, the 100% of payable benefits. So uh, my understanding is that we've got a minimum of 60%. So what we're talking about is we're asking for the maximum of 100%. Of, uh, I, I think that's what you're asking for. Oh, sorry, is this different? Okay, now I'm confused. This is a new one. Okay, so we just have, all right. Um, and then I guess the only other question that I have is in regards to um, suburban sites of more than 100 housing units. 
Um, so we're talking about just the number of dwellings. We're not talking about the density. So we're, we, this could be height, but this could also be a larger area, I think is what you're what you're talking okay so I just wanted to make sure that I'm on the same page uh, and I think now that I have two pages I am on the same page thank you <laughs> thank you councillor uh, Purdy yeah. thank you mr. mayor and I I just wanted clarification uh, for point number two I'm wondering what is the implication of a site being independently appraised as opposed to what and what does that mean Cassie uh, through the mayor to the councillor, so this would mean that we would not use the value that it's in the land use bylaw and in the report set value for plan amendments based on floor area, uh, for example. Uh, it would mean that each site would would be appraised, um, you know, I guess before and after, and, and see what the left is, and using the twelve percent formula um, that's for future growth notes. So I assume. If, oh, okay, so. So it would be a different land value potentially with, with the independent appraiser. Now, I think I heard you say earlier that there was a weight on appraisals. And that's one of the reasons why you didn't include it in this particular report is because it could potentially delay much needed development. So do we have capacity in, in the appraiser market, I guess, to, to handle all of the developments? Like would that be a, would that be a further delay on developments in HRM to, to have this particular um, point? Well, through the mayor to the councilor, I guess uh, it is hard to know. We know they're very busy right now with all the activity happening in the market, so there is a bit of a wait. Um, and you know, we have to procure services and manage things, so there's also some, some staff resource implications. Uh, however, because it's only for plan amendment applications. Right now, we counted about a dozen plan amendment applications in the suburban area, so it's not right now a huge number. We're getting inquiries, of course, all the time. Um, so it's not every development that's as of right, of course. It's only plan amendments. So, so I guess we'll have to see. I guess that's part of our advice to see whether that's reasonable. We may recommend something else. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think for us to look at it is, you know, um, it's not a decision at this point here. Yeah. So all of these, obviously, considerations will come back in the staff report for yes. consideration with that. Okay, perfect, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was just uh, clicking through, but uh, the exam begins now. Um, center pl the center plan piece, I was trying to remind myself, is like, well, you know, the calculations, because uh, when, when I look at Councillor Morris's motion, um, you know, I think of one and three could be very applicable for center plan as well, right? As we uh, look at those pieces, um, you know, that 100% uh, benefit, um, you know, could be very relevant for that too. The only uh, the only thing that I would caution council on, um, you know, parking spaces, you know, lobby yard, all that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, um, that's maybe not the priority right now, but um, you know, the incentive, you know, I think heritage is, uh, is, a, is a valid spending of your density bonus too. And that is one um, that I'd be reluctant to um, cut that one off, right? But the other one, but the other piece, Yes, totally, by all means. So uh, I very much in support of Councillor Morris's supplemental here, and I think this would be a good addition, and I think the councillor has very much done her homework, as I can tell, based on uh, Kate Green's response. So uh, this seems to be good work. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cuddle. Mayor, um, I just have a question about um, number two, to consider suburban sites of more than 100 housing units to be independently appraised. I'm just wondering, is that, do you think, going to lead to any kind of loopholes of having sites of only like 80 houses or, you know, like kind of the work around there? Like, is that, is that going to get us really to where we want to go or is it going to just change the way things are done in, in the industry? Um, and also, you know, I think uh, I was just going to say that uh, Deputy Mayor um, Austin brought up some good points. I mean, I do agree that we need to put um, as much as we can into affordable housing. The 60% was just the minimum, right? Not the maximum. 
but it, you know, there are some instances, whether it's heritage or there might be some community benefit that we can't foresee right now that is kind of critical to whether it's a support service or something else, that, you know, related to community need that we might want to that we might want to consider. So um, I'll wait for the report to come back on this to uh, kind of make a final determination on that. But I, I, I do think that, you know, it is good to have a little bit of wiggle room sometimes to um, to look at um, community benefits that we might not be able to foresee right in right in this moment. Um, but if you could uh, uh, give me your thoughts on number two and around how something like that might actually shift the way in which large sites are developed. Because if, I, if I'm right, if I, if I look at, there's one in Spryfield, they have different builders building different sections. I think each section doesn't have 100 homes in it. There are a lot less than that. In some cases, it's like 10 homes going to one company and 30 homes going to another. And so when that happens, I'm assuming it's divided up into smaller sites. So I'm just wondering how often do you get something that's 100 houses on one site? Uh, through the mayor to the councillor, so uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you how, how often, uh, but I think this would apply to plan amendment applications. So for example, Sandy Lake, as uh, you know, was said before, it's a, it's a huge site and will likely be, should be approved. You'll be dividing into small you know, development agreements or sub areas later in that builders, but right now, the plan amendment would come as a, as a whole site. So I think you would come, uh, so I would probably lean more towards the land area, but I think we can look at it because we never know how many units may end up initially. So it would be hard to put that in a plan because I don't know whether it's 100 or 99. <laughs> they would trigger the appraisal, like I, we often don't know, we're moving more towards build form. Uh, so I think the unit count may be perhaps tricky and I think we would also have to change the approach because the, the current, framework is for large sites with infrastructure and roads. So this, this will be more of much smaller scale, which may require a different kind of, you know, method for the appraisal. So, so we'll, we can look at it and come back to you with options, but yeah. yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Mayor. Obviously, it's important what's before us, plus the uh, friendly added amendment. Um, I just wanna put staff on notice that perhaps there will be some rare occasions coming forward. For Porter's Lake, Seven Lakes, perhaps. Uh, Blue Heron Estates in West Chesapeake at exit 20 at Highway 107 is another site. And the third, of course, is Muscadabra Harbor with the uh, approved provincial special planning application. So there are going to be some rural opportunities where they can provide their own on site water and septic. So this kind of plan should look at those rare examples, as you put it in the report, and uh, hope that the future regional plan amendments can address those. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Colleagues, I see an empty board, so I think we're on the main uh, motion. Uh, oh, on the amendment, yeah, the amendment. We're still on the amendment. Ready for a question on the amendment, colleagues? That's carried. Thank you, Councillor Morris. Anybody else on the main motion now as amended? Ready for the question, colleagues? Commence voting. All votes complete. So that carries. Thank you very much, colleagues. Um, no, Councillor Hensby, no, you're leaving. I know you're leaving to go to Minesville. No? Councillor Hensby on a point of Hensbyism. Uh, just to let you know, I conveyed my regrets to the Mineville Community Association because of the duration of today's public hearing. I'll be staying for the rest of the meeting, especially the in-camera oh, discussion. So job. I'll be staying with you folks to, to earn my pay like the rest of you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the warning, Councillor. Thank you, folks. Thanks to everybody who took part this evening. We are going to go to uh, in camera as quickly as we can. No, I want to do in camera. I want to get in camera done. We got staff. Uh, we're going back in camera to finish up the in camera. Then we'll come out and do uh, 18.2. Uh, no, I think 18.1's in.
camera, isn't it? That's Councillor Morris. All right, are we, uh, can somebody move, do we, do, we, do we need to move to go back in? Or we were in the public hearing, we didn't come out of in camera, so we're still in camera, do we need a motion to go in? I would move a motion to go back into in camera. Councillor Kent, seconded by Councillor Lovelace, all in favor? In camera on an ASAP basis.
What, the second time? Or? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Was, okay. and plus, last game of the year. That was a good game. Uh, last game. time we played. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we, we, we gave you everything. That
Oh, I'm sorry, guys. We're not quite finished in camera. You're going to have to go back. Uh... <clears throat> Okay, we are back in uh, public. We will deal with one more item and then we'll ratify the work that we did in camera. So the one item is uh, in the name of Councillor Outhead. One item, right? All right, thank, thank you, Mayor. And, and uh, first of all, thank you for uh, staying, folks, late, to, late tonight, and I hope this won't take uh, very long. The, uh, the other thing is thank you to my colleagues for allowing me to bring this forward uh, as a st uh, the information report forward on this. Uh, information item number six deals with uh, the Bedford uh, West Fire Station and also the, uh, the uh, Bedford Library. So the, the West Bedford Fire Station have no issues with that uh, report was uh, good, gives us some options that we'll uh, debate and discuss during the, uh, the BAL. Uh, debate which will come. The portion that dealt with the uh, Bedford Library uh, caused me some concerns and uh, as a result I thought we needed to have some uh, discussion and provide some direction. I won't go into a whole lot of details but I think we all know now, you've heard me harping about it long enough, that uh, for, for almost 30 years Bedford has needed a new library. It, it's 6,000 square feet for the population size of Bedford. It should be something closer to 30,000 square feet. Uh, the temporary location on the Dartmouth Road, which is rented, rented was uh, chosen as a temporary location in 1996. Uh, since that time, the population of Bedford has quadrupled, plus West Bedford has been built. And we've all seen through things that Way has circulated and Patty and, and uh, Finance, uh, we all know how the tax base and, and the assessment base has also grown in that area. So it, it, it is time to do that. The staff in there is outstanding, but they do not have the space to run the kind of programs that we are able to run in Dartmouth, Woodlawn, Kesham Goodman, Sackville, etc. The thing that caused some discussion when this information item came forward is was the discussion or the mention of a second location in Bedford. And a second location has never been discussed by council and it's never been voted on by council. So that was the first thing that jumped out on me. And the second thing was the fact and, and the reason why I asked for this staff report, this information report, was that we have this opportunity on the waterfront it's in the design to include a library. We did not, we can't ask the feds in the province to fund it out of PTIF, et cetera, because it doesn't qualify. We took it out of our ask to the feds, but there was a decision made by councils a couple of years ago, and Jock would remind us of this, that the waterfront terminal and ferry uh, set up, if it goes forward, there's no guarantee that it'll go forward, but if it's to go forward, the uh, library was also supposed to be designed into that space. And the, and the library board and, and Ose and her staff have gone and, and uh, actually designed something that's, that's uh, pretty cool, I think. The dilemma I'm in and my, my uh, district is in is that the staff uh, projections for capital uh, project for a library in Bedford keeps getting pushed out. And I've been allowed it to be pushed out a couple of times for Central Library, for Woodlawn, for Kesham Goodman. But no, pushing it out again till 2029, 30 is, is not acceptable. So we have two dilemmas. One is we have this opportunity on the waterfront that isn't funded. And we have the Bedford Library uh, capital plan being pushed out now to 27, 28, 29. And so basically it wouldn't be built till 2030, which is not, which is not fair. The compromise on this, and I've certainly been discussing uh, this with Osa and her team, is that I would like us to give direction to staff uh, to uh, continue the process to having a space incorporated into the ferry terminal on the Bedford Basin if we receive the federal and provincial funding for that. 
and they, uh, we can have that discussion. Now, there's a motion. Do you have that motion, uh, Krista, so you can put it up? There is a motion here. Uh, what I want to do right now, the vision is for a 15,000 square foot, uh, sort of pretty funky and unique uh, library and outdoor library space on the Bedford waterfront if we go ahead with this project. Um, I think it needs to be a little larger than that. That'll come with its pros and cons. OSA has some concerns about the, uh, the parking and the size of the facility, et cetera. So what my motion is, uh, and I'd like this, we, I, I, we need direction that we're gonna continue on with this vision of it being there. But I, I'm asking that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administered Office, Officer to prepare a staff report investigating options for the size of the Bedford Waterfront Library prior to proceeding with the Mill Cove Ferry Terminal. So we need to find some money and we need to have one more look at this just to see when it comes to parking and when it comes to the size of facility, it could be a little larger. Not the 30 or 35,000 square feet that ideally you would have in something like a Kesham Goodman, but could, is there a way of getting this a little bit larger than the 15,000 square feet, A, and then B, if not, then, then so be it, but let's have one final look at it and the parking that would be needed, and let's, uh, let's get the uh, funding uh, in place should this overall project go ahead. And I've run that past uh, I've run that past Kathy and and, uh, and John and others, and uh, everybody sort of thought that this was a reasonable motion. So that is the that is the ask. We what we're reconfirming that we want a library on that location, and that we I'm asking that if we could have one last look, if, if we could reasonably make it slightly larger and a little <coughs> bit more parking. Uh, to deal with that, uh, because we, we pretty much have a clean slate there. We're hopefully gonna get some land on the waterfront for a dollar from the province. A pile of rocks that's been there for over a decade could be turned into a, a city building opportunity of a, a hub and a core. And uh, let's, see, uh, let's see what we can do. So that's my motion, and I believe you put it up, Krista, did you? Okay. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you very much, folks, for waiting. Just, just to be clear, this doesn't, this is not going to the budget adjustment list or anything. This is a report that will come back, and if money's required, it'll be found uh, through the normal channels. Right. Is Whatever the they Kathy, are, Jerry finds sure the advice, money. I believe. Okay. So I was going to ask Kathy just to confirm that, then, Mayor. Yeah, Kathy, uh, on that. John McPherson is not here. I'm just going to look to Denise to progress and OSA to progress the report this year. I don't think we need additional funding. Okay. They're nodding. We're okay. All right. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so I can definitely support the staff report request to get more information. I, uh, I do have to note. Like it's it, this, where we are here at 10 to uh, 11 discussing this, you know, actually quite detailed report. No, we don't, Councillor. No, we don't. Well, we do not normally here at this hour. We, actually, this is exactly why. We this is why we should right not be doing this. Right now. Because, you know, rather than having a fulsome discussion about a very interesting report that's come forward, we're now just going to put up our hands because we're all tired, right? This is not good governance. Like, you know, we might as well not have done this in some ways. Like, uh, it, I'm very aggravated by this whole situation. Um, the one thing that I will say, since we are going to have a debate, I'm going to say my piece about it. Um, I do have some concerns about this, and, you know, it's been the nagging piece about the ferry terminal piece as well. Um, you know, my, you know, when you think about, like, things, things to worry about, my biggest kind of nightmare in our capital plan is the ferry and the library and the Bedford waterfront. And the reason why is not because these things aren't needed in Bedford, it's because there's nothing else there. Right, the location is very isolated, and you know if we spend a bunch of money on transit uh, in terms of like buses, if something doesn't work, you can repurpose it. It's an awfully big bet on the ferry terminal, and it's an awfully big bet on the location. Um, hopefully, it can be grow to become something that's not just a pile of rock. But right now, it's a rather major investment in a place that is not actually where the community is, and I, you know, I. I, I have some real concerns about that. So I can support this, ask for a staff report. I would really hope that we can get another lens on that 
piece because that is, that is of all things that we're kind of spending money on the one that's kind of nagging me in the back of my mind it's not it's not the form it's not you know all these other kind of big projects it's the what if we build it and nobody comes and uh, this like you know seaport market that was a real big pitch too back in the day and it has so there's some locational similarities to that project to you know what we what we're talking about here at this location so um, I, I hope when the report comes back, if we are going to be taking kind of a look at this, that we can really kind of test out that that piece, because uh, it's the one, like I said, it's my main worry. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Um, I, I don't share the Deputy Mayor's view about, A, the time of day in the report, um, and also the, the location. So... You know, previous councils, probably 20, 15, 20 years ago, approved all the stuff that happened, especially the West Bedford stuff, uh, where most of the growth has been. But the, the I don't even know if you could call this the downtown area, the, the area of Bedford along the waterfront could be the new downtown uh, when you think about Bedford and community building. And one of the things at Amalgamation was, uh, you know, Dartmouth took a while because of things like Bears Lake and Dartmouth Crossing, but downtown Dartmouth became better than it's ever been uh, since amalgamation. And it wasn't amalgamation, I'm sure Gloria would let us all know that. It wasn't amalgamation that caused it, but it was the fact that it was a cool place to be and with the, the plans that we had going forward and the demand for uh, development where people wanted to be, that became the cool thing. Because of the approval of what happened, kind of like Rockingham, West Bedford, that area is what's grown. The actual kind of, you know, from Pete's all the way down to Mill Cove, very little's actually happened along there. And Bedford should be a town again. It should be a community. It should be a great place when you go up there that people don't have to leave to go to a library, they don't have to leave to go to a rec center, they don't have to leave to go to shopping uh, or work. And I think this whole area could be something special. I think this is a city building project for Halifax. I know some people don't like big city building projects, uh, but this for me is making Bedford Bedford as part of HRM. So I'm, I'm going to support Councillor Outhit on this uh, to take another look and see if this is feasible uh, and if we can make it bigger because um, I think it, <laughs> look at the population of Bedford. It needs to be bigger. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So just a, a quick question. I, I still don't have access to the motion. Um, so it's not on the screen. I'm just wondering if we can get it on the screen. Am I the only one that? No, the oh, so can it be emailed to us or something so we can see it? Um, I, thank you, Councillor Cleary, for those those comments. You know, my my uh, my. It, you know, I agree. Like, yes, de the Deputy Mayor, destination is definitely an issue as far as you know creating a destination um, because uh, you know we could have uh, a, a ferry that's empty one way and and full the other right <laughs> during uh, during commuter times. But you know the other thing is I, I think we need to start thinking bigger about city building options here. Um, you know, like I, I've said this many times, I'd love to see an aquarium uh, there as well. You know, here we are, a, a coastal city, and we don't even have an aquarium. Um, you know, so these these are things. Obviously, I'm 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 just going on and on here because I don't have the motion. So um, I just think that I can't vote on anything or, or have any more comments until I see the motion, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor, was the motion? Uh, thank Councillor, um, Councillor Arthur. Th uh, thank you, Mayor, and, and uh, thank you for the, for the, for the good comments. Um, Central Library helped rejuvenate the Spring Garden Road. And we, we had a lot of criticism when we first came to Council to spend $60 million on a book Mausoleum, those were the things we heard. The, the convention center helped rejuvenate downtown. 
the library being on the Dartmouth waterfront in Alderney and the theater help rejuvenate downtown Dartmouth. There is no reason to think that this rejuvenation of the Bedford waterfront uh, couldn't be helped by, by a library. The, the thing that's interesting, while a lot of development has, ha it's not quite accurate some of the things that you've heard because since this library on North Street was opened, my neighborhood Ridgevale didn't exist. Nottingham didn't exist. The ravines didn't exist. The lower portion of Larry Utec, who likes to come down to the Bedford Highway because they're terrified of the three together roundabouts and don't want to go up the other way. None of, those are true stories, folks. I get the calls, people saying, please don't put anything more in West Bedford. I'm please don't build any more roundabouts. I'm terrified of them, it's, it's sad. None of those places were built at the time. None of those, all those places have been built since we got that original too small library. So what we're looking to do here is to replace the Bedford Library. We're not looking to build a regional library. We are looking to replace a library that did not keep up when the town went from 6,000 to 25,000. And yes, we put another 25,000 on top of it in a place called West Bedford. But we haven't even kept up with the growth of those communities that I, I mentioned to you, including my own neighborhood built in the 90s. And, and other neighborhoods, and, and people will walk down. Those, those little shops on the Bedford Highway that used to be the Esquire, you can, and, and the ice cream shop, and, the, and the, uh, the Turkish restaurant, you can't even get into those parking lots at night. DeWolf Park, you can barely get in there anymore. It's one of the busiest parks. We have, we've had to ask, add extra cleanings and extra garbage pickup, it's so big. I am not worried about traffic going to this library, and I hope. I hope also the ferry, although yes, I would have preferred rail, but, uh, but and, and of course, even that ferry station, folks, that is the beginning. It's the beginning of an expanded ferry service that will include Shannon Park someday, the bottom of Larry Utec, perhaps the Dartmouth Yacht Club in the bottom of Burnside. It's the beginning of a ferry network where we will use our waterways to commute instead of roads or in addition to roads. And the development along the Bedford Highway alone, the 10 to 15,000 people that will be living between Mount St. Vincent and Sunnyside along the Bedford Highway alone will generate enough ridership for the ferry and this library. I'm not worried about it. I, I, I think that there'll be, uh, I, and uh, I think the people will, uh, it, and, and, and just look how far people travel to use Central Library. Do you think they walk to Central Library, half of those people that are there? S some of them do, but they also bus in from the suburbs. They bike in from other com parts of the community. It's become a, a catchment area and part of city building. Anyway, I think this uh, is a, a good location uh, for this, uh, a good part of the rejuvenation of the waterfront. I think it's an exciting design, uh, and I just hope that we'll be able to find a way to add a little more parking and a little more space to this because there is no guarantee. I, I spoke with almost all of you, and nobody told me that they were comfortable with supporting two, building two libraries in Bedford within six years or seven years when you need them in Fall River and you need them in Timberley and you need them in Eastern Passage and Hammonds Plains and Tantallon uh, expansion, et cetera. So let's do it. Let's do it where it's, it's been long planned to go. The town was gonna put their, their community buildings, their town hall and their library on the waterfront. Let's put it where it's geographically the center of North Bedford and Larry Utec. And let's see if we can make it a little larger. And question is probably a good idea. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, ready for the question. <clears throat> that motion carries. And just a note on the uh, schedule. Thank you to the folks who spent a lot of their day waiting here uh, for us for a short debate. Uh, in terms of timing, perhaps some of you can understand why we moved the committee the whole, because uh, that's what Denise is waiting for. She thinks we're going to do it now uh, on the uh, thing. Cool, so. um, Okay, folks, let's have a look at our in-camera items. We've ratified, we, we passed the minutes. 17.2, Councillor Lovelace. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential report dated February 14th, 2023, and 2 direct the private and confidential report dated February 14th, 2023 to be maintained private and confidential. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. Carried, thank you very much. 17.3 is, I believe, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential report dated March 3rd, 2023. They gave it to me by mistake. <laughs> thank you. Sorry, that, you thank you. <laughs> I move that Halifax Regional Council approve the direction given during the in-camera, in-private March 21st, 2023 session. Is that really it? That's it. Yeah. That's Ready for the question, colleagues? Seconded by Councillor Mason. Okay, so that okay. motion passes, that's 17.3. What was that, 17.3? 17.4, Councillor Mason. I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private confidential staff report dated March 10th, 2023 and direct the private confidential staff report dated March 10th, 2023 be maintained as private confidential. Question. Are we ready for the question? That motion is carried. Thank you. Councillor Mason, I'll go back to you for 17.5. A little uh, handwritten note here, as amended. Is that right, clerks? I'll just read it and you tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, that I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private confidential staff report dated March 13th, 2023, as amended, and to direct that the private confidential staff report dated March 13th, 2023, be maintained private confidential. I so move. Second, Councillor Stoddard, ready for the question, colleagues. Question. All votes complete. Carried. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Item 17.6, Councillor Morse. The motions to adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential report dated March 21st, 2023. Direct that the private and confidential report dated March 21st, 2023 be maintained private and confidential. Does that sound right to you? What she said. Second. Second by Councillor Lovelace. Ready for the question on this one? Question. That motion is carried. Colleagues, that's our in-camera items. I will, and we've done our added items. Notices off motion, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, sir. 
Take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to move the proposed amendments of Administrative Order 58, respecting the delegation of certain authorities, the purpose of which is to modify the process for approval of non-disclosure agreements. Thank you, Councillor Cuttle. Notice of motion. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> My goodness. Um, Take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to move one, first reading of proposed bylaw F203, respecting fees for permits and licenses, and two, first reading of proposed bylaw B206, respecting the building code, the purpose of which is to implement a revenue increase through adjusting the building permit fees. Thank you. Anybody else? Just for mind, folks, we have a um, budget meeting next week. We have council in two weeks. Um, and uh, no, not tomorrow at 9.30. And uh, happy birthday to somebody among us without identifying who it is. Wish you the very best. I'll accept a motion to adjourn. Councillor Purdy, Councillor Kent. Before we do that, it's also my mother's birthday today, 83. So she, although she's probably asleep in her bed in Shelburne, Sandy Point, happy birthday, Mama. I'm sure she's, uh, she's watching. I bet you she's watching. She might be. Really? All right, folks, we are uh, adjourned. Uh, take your time, relax, spend some time in City Hall, and then go home when you feel comfortable.